Good evening, folks. Welcome to another edition of Heavy Metallurgy. I'm one of your hosts, Alan, from Let's Talk Metal, and I'm here with my regular co-host, Marty. Marty, how are you doing this evening? Marvelous. How are you guys doing? Doing pretty good, pretty good. Doing well. Yes, and we've also got a guest this evening, all the way from the other side of the planet, who uh, here is about uh, 12 hours ahead of us, which puts him <laughs> on Saturday. We've been working out the math behind the scenes. Yep. Is Simon from the Explosive Action YouTube channel, which is quite a big one and all kinds of cool stuff on it. Simon, thank you for joining us. How are you doing tonight? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Alan, Marty. Excited Glad to, to do it. Glad to have you, man. Yep, you've been on our list to invent for a while, but uh, it, it just took us a little while to do the math and figure out, yes, I think he actually is awake. At, uh, I am awake. At this I'm time. not joining you on the tinnies. I am on the coffee. So. Good deal, good deal. So, yes, we are all here for another evening. I hope everybody has had a good week and is ready to rest, relax, and have some fun talking heavy metal stuff. Indeed. As we usually do, Marty and I talk to our guests and ask them to pick a topic they would feel really passionate and excited to talk about for the stream. And then we kind of mold it into shape and re wheel it out here for everybody to enjoy. So Simon, um, what topic have you chosen for us this evening? Uh, I chose international metal and I did that intentionally because when people say international metal, they mean not America mm -hmm. and that's fine. <laughs> and I'm not America. So I get to talk about Australia. Absolutely. Uh, yep. And so the way we did this, Marty and I also sort of chose non-American areas to focus on for the evening. And we decided early on that we would pick areas that are a little off the beaten path. Uh, not trying to be totally obscure, but we decided we didn't want to just pick Canada, the UK, Germany, it, countries that you know are pretty high profile in terms of the heavy metal community and get a lot of discussion and coverage anyway. So we figured we'd you know try to cover some other scenes uh, and incorporate those. So Marty, what did you decide to pick for the evening? Um, I kind of went outside my wheelhouse and um, just kind of flippantly threw South America into the ring before I did a lot of research and realized that I had to really kind of scrape together to hit at least a 10 quota, which I did do. Um, not saying that I dislike South American metal, but it's probably, I never really had a really strong connection to it other than, you know, maybe the early years of it. Mm -hmm. um, I was always more of a European Scandinavian um, Southern U S um, uh, styles of metal, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it'd be a challenge and it turned out to be fun to dig and refamiliarize myself with some of these titles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, uh, kind of had the same experience and, uh, you know, there were definitely some scenes that got more exposure here in the States than others did. And yeah, I think, you know, a lot of those South American titles were ones you had to dig for a little bit back in the day. They didn't have always the greatest distribution and, you could find out about them, but you had to be really paying attention to the logos on the T-shirts and, you know, the bands mentioned in the thank yous, you know, down at the bottom of the liner notes and then have to do some digging with tape trading and such to find those. Um, the same is obviously true for, you know, bands from Australia, the New Zealand area. Those didn't always get circulated a lot in the U.S. Very true. Yep. Um, for myself, I decided to choose Benelux which I'm really hoping somebody has heard of because Marty and Simon looked at me like I had lobsters coming out of my nose when I said this. Uh, but basically, Benelux used to be, maybe still is, uh, you know, sort of a political economic entry entity in uh, Central Europe made up of Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. It's one of those little anagrams where there's a few letters from each country's name and you splice it all together and you get Benelux. And so... This was an area I hadn't visited for quite a while myself. So similar to your situation, Marty, I really had to dust some things off, dig a bit. Turns out I don't own physical copies of several of the things that I want to talk about anymore. They're still part of my digital collection. So I'll be showing off a lot of pictures tonight rather than a ton of old original vinyl pressings of stuff. But yeah, those countries you know, had active scenes and you know there are some you know, cool albums uh, buried there they sometimes get a little bit 
overlooked. One common theme I came across with a lot of bands from those countries was that they were kind of overshadowed by bands from Sweden and Germany and the UK. That you know, most people when they talk European heavy metal, they gravitate to those three countries. And you know, other bands, you know, like you know, Merciful Fate, of course, put Denmark on the map. Uh, Baron Rojo puts you know uh, Spain on the map. These countries, you know, with Belgium and Luxembourg and such, they uh, you know sometimes didn't have a big band until maybe much later. You know, in more recent years, with acts like Within Temptation. Uh, but back in the day. They didn't really have you know that one band that the whole scene could rally around and draw a lot of attention to, so uh, the scenes yeah a little more obscure. The releases aren't quite as well known, but there's still some pretty cool ones, and we'll go through some of those as we work through tonight. Uh, before we get any deeper though, something I did want to bring up while I fix my lights here is Simon. How are things going with the Explosive Action Channel? You're known of course for having a you know killer metal collection, but also a tremendous movie collection. So I wanted to give you some yep. uh, time to just tell us how the channel's been going. Oh, thanks. It's um, it's doing well. Um, ever since I was coerced to appearing on camera um, <laughs> rather than showing my hands. Thank God. Um, which has been about two years now, I think, of doing that. Maybe even a bit longer. Um, yeah, that, that really improved things. Um, and also, I mean, I've been doing it since 2010. It's been going for quite some time. Um, so the Explosive Action universe started with the blog, it's explosiveaction.com, which is me just doing um, movie reviews of really shit B-grade action films. That's the point of that. Then I thought, well, I could uh, start a YouTube video and talk about the DVDs themselves as I pick them up, because big on physical media. Um, and so that's what that has been about for ages. And I always wanted to talk about the other stuff, which is metal, because that's been on my you know my, my equal passion since the mid 90s um and uh yeah i just did it once on the tail end of a video I talked about movies and i went oh by the way here's some cds and records i got people seem to like it so i just started to split the videos up do metal updates and then movie updates um and uh yeah there's an instagram as well i just show off again similar kind of stuff movies music um but yeah it's going really well really um enjoying the the, the diversity now that i have on it um so yeah and if anybody good. wants to check out simon and alan's channel i've got links in the description please go and subscribe to these fine gentlemen they're doing the lord's work through <laughs> uh <laughs> spending lots of money on tangible media we're doing work anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, but uh, so Simon, quick quick question: how how big is the movie collection roughly, and how big is the metal collection? How many items in each? Um, okay. According to DVD Profiler, the movies are about eight thousand discs, okay. um, and the music's probably approaching about two thousand across LPs, CDs, tapes. Okay. So, um, it's quite extensive. I mean, you can see. Well, oh yeah. Blu-rays, and then it goes to CDs. Um, records are below that. And that's all DVDs there, which is um, backed on. Like it's got another side, and then there's a whole corner. Um, there's a man cave to a video if anybody wants to check it out. But it's um, it's more than what you see here. That's for sure. It's a, it's a pretty impressive collection. Absolutely. Now I want to put you on the spot yep. and make you do the Sophie's Choice thing. <clears throat> the, the Australia is burning down and you get on the last plane out and you only have room to take one collection or the other and no mixing or matching. You can save the, you can save the movie collection or the metal collection. Which one do you save? Look, it's probably the music collection. Okay. Really. Um, yes, because it, it is um, the oldest of the collection. I think the CDs particularly, I got in CDs before any other format. Um, got started to buy CDs in about 94 mm -hmm. um, and all the good stuff, a lot of it is in what I'm showing today, has not left the collection um, there's a lot of sentimental attachment to some of the actual CDs here um, so I think I'd pick that, pretty sure um, and there's a lot a lot of this stuff would be harder to get again than the films right? Yeah. Okay. so and, you know, if, I, if I left this house with all my music and was told you can't 
ever buy DVDs and Blu-rays again well I just sigh and then get a Netflix a streaming account or something <laughs> Perfectly fair. Perfectly the thing fair. that always blows me away, you know, you know, being here in America, I, it, I don't really know how much um, trickles down to Australia. I mean, it seems like mm. a shipping logistics nightmare, <clears throat> no matter how you slice yeah. it. But, you know, watching your channel and watching uh, Baron Von Doom, Brendan Von Doom, yep. Yep. who was in Melbourne, or is he? Is yeah, he he's, in, he's in Melbourne, yeah. He's down I south. I mean, you guys, I mean, you especially have been finding original pressings of killer shit like shit that i don't even see mm -hmm. i haven't seen ever seen in any shops i've been in here around you know michigan or any other places i've been it's just mm. so much fun to see what you're digging up at these places i'm like how the fuck did that make it down there you know now that's a really good question some of the stuff um i've got i got four more original press 80 stuff in um yesterday it's going to appear in another video three of those came in sleeves that had the um modern invasion yellow triangle sticker mm -hmm. which it seems to be more worldwide known than half the band is that is that company dead and gone i mean oh look technically it's there um okay. i think he still does something to do with distribution but i don't see the triangles anymore yeah um but having that triangle means he imported it so back in the 80s or 90s we imported everything so unless it was an australian band like you know mortal sin um you know who got got a pressing at you know a sydney uh or victorian based um record plant everything came from overseas yeah um and that's why we have you know utopia records in the city um founded in 1978 their official name is utopia import records so everything just came in mm -hmm. so that's pretty much it i mean we're, we're we're an island everything's got to come into us um yep. we didn't have the manufacturing to do a lot of that ourselves so yeah that's pretty much why yeah you've had a lucky streak here this past year <laughs> and through last year too it's just been pretty fucking crazy some of the stuff you've been pulling I've out i've been pretty happy um i mean I, i've pretty much drained um some of my honey honey holes like the physical shops i've pretty much drained them for the moment but i get a lot of luck and i know brendan does too out of um ebay and discogs I just have save searches and it's much easier in discogs when you're in australia to say you know, have a bookmark for get me all the thrash lps country shipping from australia mm -hmm. and it doesn't update very much but it, you know if you're going to do that usa you wouldn't be able to keep up with it mm -hmm. i can keep up with that and check it every couple hours so that that helps quite a lot good deal awesome mm. all right gentlemen are we ready to get into our lists for the evening ready ready do it. All right, so we'll do this the same way we usually do. Simon, as the guest, you'll go first. I'll okay. follow up, and uh, we'll save the best for last with Marty, and then we'll go right back to the top of the batting order. All right, cool. I will preface this and get out of the way. There will be no ACDC. Or Misery <laughs> Zolman, apparently. No, I forgot Misery Zolman. <laughs> get over it, Marty. <laughs> there will be no Midnight Oil. There will be no Rose Tattoo. I'm sorry, none of this. Crocodile no Dundee. Barns, no, no Crocodile Dundee, no Wiggles, none of that. All Armored Angel all the time. I got <laughs> As I said, you're just going to have to wait. I, anyway. I'm a patient man. I'm a patient man. <laughs> um, it is, it, everything seems to have pretty much turned out to be extreme bands. So if you're looking for 1982 glam band, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to help you today. Um, but I'm going to open it with one of my favorites. This is a Bremelin. Um, these are Victorian uh Victorian guys, Melbourne, Victoria. Um, this album came out in 1995, self-titled, just called a Bremlin. Um, and that's pretty early on for having a brutal death metal band in Australia. So, you know, the, the, the US bands were not that far along, but much further along at that point anyway. So yeah. 1995 is pretty good. Um, this particular one is the local pressing from Thrust, which is a hilarious name. You get the EP as well. So, hang on. one of those old school flipper things, you get the EP. Mm. And um, now I can't close the damn disc. There we go. Right. So, yeah, Bremelin. Um, they used to be called uh, Asheron or Acheron um, and obviously changed their name for obvious reasons because there's the US band with the same name. Um, and 
I got this, yeah, when it came out about 95, 96. I was still in high school. It was definitely the heaviest, most brutal thing I'd ever heard at that point. Um, they got picked up by Repulse Records in the US, one of their earlier releases. Um, as I said, this is the, the Australian press. It's incredibly hard to get now. Um, very unique, deep vocals. Um, they reformed recently, did a new album, and the, the singer, his name is also Simon, uh, it hasn't changed. It, he sounds exactly the same. It's very deep, unique growl. Um, I can't think of any other band that sounds like like him particularly. Um, the last track on this is uh, Kantara, which is a Dead Can Dance cover, which is pretty unique. I'm not sure why they did it, but it's, um, you know, it's like this dark sort of ambient thing with, um, you know, tribal drums and then this growl over it, which <laughs> sounds kind of amusing, but it's really cool. Um, so, yeah, as I said, this is really hard to get, but what you can get that is still pretty easy is um, Century Media got everything that the band ever did. They did an EP, this album, um, and another album after it called Dead Speak. And until last year, they did a new album. But everything else before that, you can get this five CD or five LP box through Century Media, and that thing's really easy to get. I encourage everybody to get it because it's awesome stuff. Um, yeah, and last year's album's called Never Enough Snuff, which is a absolutely fantastic title for an album. Um, it, yeah, so it's 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 brutal death metal. It doesn't take itself too seriously, um, particularly on that later album. But um, yeah, awesome stuff. I got this little thing. I picked it up from Utopia Records as a, as a bit of a keepsake. Um, it's a carcass tour itinerary. And I got this um, pretty much when the album came out. So as I said, they used to be called Asheron. Um, and they toured, they supported Carcass on the Heartwork tour. And you can see, uh, where is it? Here, that they supported with Armored Angel as Asheron. So they've been around for a while. Really, really good band. Bremelin. Very cool. Yeah. I, I've heard some of their stuff in the past. I remember the vocal in particular. Oh, yeah. Like you said, it's extremely deep. Yep. He's really good. Yep. But yeah, I hadn't thought of that band in a long time. That's a really cool one to start with. Who's next? Right. Alan. All right. So um, I'm going to start my little Benelux tour here in Luxembourg. If you check the uh, metal archives, there are a whopping 94 heavy metal bands from Luxembourg, which means that's about 0.00. .00 six percent of all the bands that are listed currently <laughs> so uh not exactly the uh deepest heavy metal scene but there was one band as i went through the list it's like oh yeah i remember those guys and i wanted to make sure i included at least one entry from luxembourg so here it is uh it's a band called plague wielder and it's a death doom band it's not an older act they were active in kind of the mid 2010s and they did an album called Chambers of Death. Uh, again, this is one I've got digitally, so we'll just go with pictures for some of these tonight. Um, it's very solid in the Death Doom style. It's not too slow. It does not get into funeral pacings at all. They include some sort of proggy elements is what tends to make them stand out from the crowd. You know, Death Doom is a pretty fun, interesting uh, genre, Sometimes, though, the bands will run together. Uh, you know, some of them stick a little bit too much to the formula and don't really have their own identity. And Plague Wielder was definitely working on trying to distinguish themselves by having these slightly more progressive elements worked in the songs. It wasn't too overbearing. You know, it was still, you know, very solid, you know, Death Doom style in terms of delivery. But, you know, they would just have, you know, extra passages or things, you know, segments of songs that would, you know, go off the traditional Death Doom script and give it a little more personality. Um, it is an album, you'll, you, the band is still finding its feet. Uh, I'm not going to call it a classic of the genre. I think they, you know, we're getting there. Uh, they did one EP and one LP to date, but then uh, things have been kind of quiet since 2015. The band's status on the mothership is currently listed as unknown, so... Don't know if there will be more releases in the future or not. It would have been interesting to hear them do at least one more album to see if they could polish, you know, kind of refine the sound a little bit. 
and come up with something just a little bit tighter because I think they had an interesting idea of trying to work in this uh, these progressive overtones with uh, the Doom Death underpinnings. I think they just needed like you know one more round of rehearsals, one more round of songwriting, and they might have produced something really really cool. And so hey, it's only been six years. Bands definitely come back from longer uh, breaks than that. So maybe they're still working on it, and we'll get a little more Plague Wielder in the future. But that is my first entry, and that's going to be the last thing I talk about from Luxembourg. <laughs> so we'll, we'll spend the rest of the night in the other two-thirds of uh, Central Europe with Belgium and the Netherlands. But before I venture into that direction, it is Marty's turn. we got to say uh, thanks to Dark Throne for uh, putting out an album called Plague Wielder. So now there yep. is... Can't oh, imagine they, where they got that name from. Yeah, there's probably 1,500 uh, plague wielders on Metal Archives right now. You can't imagine where anybody came <laughs> up with that band name. But um, for me, I mean, South America, you know, it has it has a rich metal history. Um, though there's a lot of bands I've missed out on. I mean, I think the epicenter for extreme metal when it comes to South America is Brazil, where 90% of these, what I'm showing tonight, is from Brazil, oddly enough. But um, kind of the, the spearhead of that offensive came in the form of Morbid Visions and the Bestial Devastation oh, hell by yeah. Sepultura. Be mm -hmm. Bestial Make yourself big, Marty. Make yourself big. Make, oh, shit. Rookie mistakes. <laughs> um, what there is it? Uh, Bestial Devastation came out in uh, 1985 and Morbid Visions came out in 86. So these guys were kind of the first to dip their toe. And, you know, out of this band sprouted several other projects as well. But uh, we'll get to that later. But, you know, super primitive, aggressive, sloppy, but aggressive as hell with tons of conviction is what Sepultura threw out there. And it seems to be a pretty vibrant creative thread that spun through the South American scene, to be honest, I mean, there's a lot of bands that um, uphold this <clears throat> this um, raw spirit quite effectively. And Sepultura is one of the first ones. I mean, obviously, I'm not showing anything that no one's ever heard of here, but you can't talk about South America and not mention Sepultura. So there's my first soiree into this discussion. It's a fantastic like album and EP. The older I get, the more I keep going back with Sepultura. Yeah. Like I used to be a rise of well, actually I used to be a Chaos AD guy. Yeah. And I mean I still like every everything up to and including Chaos AD, but that was my my main jam. And I started going back to a rise more and beneath the remains more. And I just kept getting uglier and uglier. Schizophrenia. Yep. Um but the, that first EP is just disgusting. It's so good. Oh yeah. I mean my first my first connection with them was Beneath the Remains. I bought mm. it because it was on Road Racer. <laughs> Yep. And I was blown away by it. So, you know, then I found schizophrenia and hearing this old shit, it's, it, it sounds like a different band. Cause it is, yep. I mean, they're kids here, yep. you know, Max and Igor, they're kids in this band. And, um, for the longest time, it was really hard for me to connect to it because I liked beneath the remains so much. And that is a band that has kind of realized who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, so going back and I just, it never really appealed to me much, but the, like you said, the older I've gotten, I've kind of gone back yep. and, I started to appreciate this stuff. I used to have a tape and now, you know, I've upgraded to the CD. So I wouldn't have done that if I didn't care, you know. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yep. did, did you see that um, Max has picked up Gyro T for the, the guitarist from that era and is doing some kind of tours ref reformation playing the old stuff with Gyro? Well, they That's did cool. with him, Igor, and that Gyro. They, they did a like a little live stream thing where they redid yeah, right. um, one of the old songs it was really yep. kind of cool yep it's they awesome. sounded great simon great you're up oh, it's to me already okay <clears throat> we're churning through it all right um i've banged on about this band um whenever anybody gives me a microphone uh that is nazul um <laughs> most people outside of australia know them for their debut totem so that's one is, i have yeah yep mm -hmm. it's um it's black metal but it's um still heavily got the death metal chunk to it um but this is the black seed ep um this came out in 1998 so they're a sydney band um they're very geographically very close to me actually um it's four tracks uh very spooky looking thing there 
uh, on this particular release, so they're, they're a little bit revolving door band for some of the members, but on this one we've got um, Steve Hughes, who's Slaughter Lord's drummer. He's also now a comedian, stand-up comedian, which is hilarious. Um, he's doing drums. Um, Reverend Chris Hades from Sadistic Execution is on one of the guitars on this EP. Um, and the other guitarist uh, goes by the name of Wraith on this one. Um, he co-runs Seance Records, which is an awesome um record distributor and label they do um, um quite a few bands these days uh, uh, pestilential shadows was the latest thing they just put out which is really good um but on this black seed ep um it's it's like a thick wall of atmospheric black metal noise uh it's dense got a keyboard layer all the way through it um the opening track I'm going to try and hold this because the spindle thing's a bit broken. Um, opening track on this, it's called Vow of Vengeance. Um, it's seven minutes of just totally sublime atmospheric black metal. Um, it, it, it's repetitive, like, a, you know, third album, Burzum, kind of repetitive. Um, it's one of those ones, I have a, I have a great memory of um, falling asleep when this thing came out uh, to a thunderstorm and I had this playing in my ears um, just on my old Sony Walkman um, and watching the lightning outside. And that was just like one of those things that's ingrained in my brain now. So that track and that experience, so good. Um, it's been reissued a few times. You can get it with like a yellow cover and then they read it. That's got um, sort of a variation on this guy in red. I think that's easy enough to get. It's got some live tracks, but um, the th three other tracks are awesome. It's more standard noisy black metal, but that first track it was um, something very different. So, yeah, Black Seed by Nazul. Get get a copy of it, whatever version you can get. It's awesome. Very cool. It's one of those band names I've heard over the years, but, yeah, never have checked out. So that will have yep. to go on the list Mm -hmm. Yeah, Totem is the only thing I have by them, I think. Totem doesn't represent the band. Like the, the, They just did an album a couple of months ago. And um, and then there's another album, I think it's 2010, called Iconoclast, uh, which they were working on for ages. Black Seed Onwards represents the band. Totem is kind of primitive, comparatively. Um, you can see, you can you can hear that it's Nazul, but it's um it's quite different. So, yeah, check out Black Seed. Right on. Alan. All right. So with Luxembourg represented, we'll uh, move over into Belgium for entry number two. Um, this is an oldie, but a goodie. It's always had a good fan following with this band. They put out three albums in pretty rapid succession, and they have been sort of active again in more recent times. Uh, the band is Acid, and I want to talk about their second album, Maniac. Uh, they actually put out two albums in 1983. Now, you know, back in the day, it wasn't unusual for bands to put out albums pretty close together. But even by 1983, you didn't often see bands do two in a year. So that was one thing that was unusual. Um, Acid has a very straightforward sound. Uh, they play pretty fast, you know, borderline speed metal structures. The song structures are pretty simple. Uh, there's more than a nod owed to early Motorhead material in their songs. Uh, you know, they had a pretty unique vocalist with Kate. I don't know exactly how to pronounce her last name, but you know she definitely gave some character to the songs. Um, but uh, definitely, you know, had you know, a timbre that fits you know this kind of you know, rough and ready, straightforward heavy metal sound as well. And yeah, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's not breaking any boundaries. And that may be something I say a lot tonight. Something I've noticed about a lot of these bands from Belgium and the Netherlands is that they're very good, solid, traditional heavy metal acts, uh, but they often played it pretty close to the vest. They didn't often work outside the box or you know try to take you know, big leaps forward and trying different things. And that's okay. You know, sometimes you're in the mood to hear something that's very groundbreaking. And sometimes you just want to have a beer and bang your head and wear denim and throw up the horns. And you know, Acid's the kind of band that's perfect for that. And yeah, these, uh, you know, those, especially the first two Acid albums, have always had a really uh, good following. 
I think they were one that benefited from an earlier repressing than a lot of things. You know, a lot of these sort of more obscure acts from the mid '80s haven't come back to light until more recent years. But Acid, I think, got I meant to check, but I think they had a repressing somewhere in the early 2000s because their stuff was never that hard to get. And I seem to remember uh, CD distributors having both those titles, even like around you know 2000, 2005 time frame. So uh, you know, Acid kind of you know was on that you know revival train a bit earlier than a lot of other bands. And yeah, poking around online about them this week, it sounds like they've been active recently, but there's currently some contention about the lineup. It sounds like, from what I can tell, Kate has separated from the rest of the band, and so now you're in one of those situations where there's two acids. There's Acid, which are some of the original members without Kate, and now there's Kate's Acid, which is Kate plus you know musicians and... It's not exactly, you know, there's a little confusion about, yeah, which one has the rights to material and which ones are going to be playing. Yeah, it it happens, it seems to happen more frequently than it should with heavy metal bands. But uh, regardless, uh, Acid's definitely one that should be on people's radar if they're looking into Belgium heavy metal. Cool. Awesome. I recognize the cover, but I've never, I've never sat down and listened to it. Me either. Yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of people talking about Acid, and I've never thrown down and investigated. Yeah, the the first album has a very similar cover. It's also kind of red with a little, mm. you know, emblem in the middle. The third album has kind of a goofy cover. It's a the third one's called Engine Beast, and it's got like a uh, a guy leaning up against a muscle car, and there's a dog and a motorcycle, and it's a it's a little cartoony looking. Uh, not bad, but it's the kind of thing you probably would pass on if you just saw it in the used bin figure. Like, hey, I don't know about that one. Okay. Uh, all right, Marty, back to South America. Well, you can't mention Sepultura without this band being too far behind them. Um, I never knew if this was Sarcophago or Sarcophago. I always called them Sarcophago. Yes, but, uh, this is their Same debut man. album, INRI. This is a lame reissue that Pavement put out some time ago. That is the worst cover I've ever it seen. It is a terrible cover, and there is no original logo. And on the inside of the artwork, there is no mm. representation of the original artwork at all. And this down the road is a EP called Rotting with a little hype sticker printed right on the J card that says, featuring original lead singer of Sepultura. Yeah, so that's tell this I was had. a band in its label who were trying really hard to get a little bit of the um, success off of Sepultura's coattails, of course. But this stuff is, in a lot of ways, very influential to a lot of bands all over the world. Um, again, I always appreciated, I always liked it, but along with that early Sepultura, it is this. I could it could be the same description: sloppy, but raw as hell fast brutal i mean the energy level is high and maybe the playing skills i mean they're a bunch of young dudes doing this stuff in 1986 is that what i said 80 this uh inri came out in 87 so i mean they you know obviously they're after sepultura but you know there's just it's this pure energy into the yep. dipping into the red uh, but not a lot of precision you know and if you like that sort of thing it's it's exciting it's raw and exciting but um I always, like I said, I found a lot more comfort in other bands and other countries, but this stuff is, it is definitely, um, hands down, really super influential, enjoyable to listen to. I was re-familiarizing myself with INRI here the other day, and um, yeah, I like it a lot better than I used to when it came out. And again, this is a super lame Pavement Records <laughs> reissue, totally. Uh, yeah, that's shocking. <laughs> it's it's like got so classics crazy. on here called uh, Ready to been. Fuck. <laughs> and um uh yeah and, uh, members of this band also were in another band from brazil called um uh, sex trash mm. um yep so yeah check out yeah if you've never heard i had that out, same, uh, undeniably influential yeah i had that same rotting cassette with that same thing printed yeah. on the j card <laughs> it, it was one that came out of the dollar 99 you know, uh sale table at camelot music way back in the day i, I knew nothing about the band but just like that's very clearly a heavy metal release of some kind, and it yep. is $2. I, I, a broke teenage Alan can pay that and yep. check it out. 
All I right. see um, human falafel in the in the chats shouted out um, Holocausto and Atomica. Atomica is the one that nobody really seems to talk about much. That band kicks ass. They're so good. I've not heard you, either of them. You need to check out both of them. Um, but Atomica, they're just fantastic. Just ugly South American thrash. Awesome. That's a good point, Simon. Yeah, Holocausto, you hear that name pop up, but I don't think I've heard Atomica before. Mm. Good stuff. All right, Simon. Back to me. Back. Um, okay. So this is... Uh, probably the biggest one i'll talk about today um i'm not going to speak on like portal and destroyer triple six everybody knows those bands uh, everybody knows this band too but i really like this particular release sadistic execution the magus uh. 1991 this thing came out but according to rock the vocalist uh, and the artist he did the picture and you'll see him he still does paintings for cover art now um if you ever seen anything that's a skull that looks like that it's a it's a rock painting so is that um, rock or reverend chris hades because they're both artists aren't they yeah but rock does the skull pointy he does things the pointy like skulls that. yeah that's rock um has it got his yeah in the corner um it's got his little signature there yeah, it's a bit hard okay. to see. right on um so he does the skull pointy ones um yeah so this was 91 this came out but according to rock they wrote the music in 86 if this actually got released in 86, it would have blown the doors off the entire world. Like, this thing is is just mental. Um, it's a bit, like, I, do, I actually do think of it a bit like Sarcophago, but more black, more death, more just unhinged. Um, it's incredibly loose stuff. Uh, the vocals are reverbed to within an inch of its life on this thing. Um, it's... <laughs> starts and ends with this um dark ambient noise industrial thing the band obviously don't give a shit they've never given a shit they've got two albums called fuck one's called fuck and then there's fuck two right they don't care i the think i used to have a vinyl uh a record uh we are death fuck you or something yeah I that's the album mm -hmm. after this we are death fuck you yeah. they, they just yeah they don't care so there's the song titles look at that first one i've tried to pronounce it and i just can't <laughs> get it out but look at the last one, which is just an ambient outro. It's called I'll Kill You, You Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, but this this is on Vampire Records, and it's very hard to get now. But this thing was everywhere in the in the mid late nineties. You could you could find it in a box of cornflakes. It was everywhere. Um, Osmos keep it in print now, so it's easy to get. Um, I think there's LPs of it too. Um, there was an LP when it first came out in uh, in 91 vampire did they did two of them a black one and a um a green like a bright green lp they were supposed to do a full run of the green but something went wrong and they only had it ended up making about 10. um so if you ever see the green lp of the magus it's licensed to print money the thing is um yeah it goes for stupid money on discogs wow. but yeah awesome awesome debut album uh crazy unhinged sadistically executed as they say on the back here <laughs> perfect all right alan all right <clears throat> so working our way around the benelux territory i want to say it as many times as i can because when do i ever get to talk about benelux uh, let's go over to the netherlands uh this is a cool one that i should have and have never actually tracked a copy of down but would like to get someday uh, so it's just in the digital collection. It's a band called Future Tense uh, with an EP called Condemned to the Gallows. Uh, again, cover's not much to see there, but it's pretty unassuming looking. Not much of a logo to it or anything. But this band should ring a tiny bell for folks that know their 1980s heavy metal compilations because the band did make an appearance on a fairly high profile metal compilation and i'll see we'll let the chat uh chime in let's see uh who gets points for their heavy metal street cred tonight by knowing which compilation future tent showed up on ah uh, anyway they had this one ep and it's quite good it's a little weird in that the songs are kind of divided up into two styles. There are some songs that are pretty fast. You know, they're focusing on, again, sort of a proto-speed metal sound. You wouldn't call them speed metal 
the way we refer to it today, but they're, you know, working on faster tempos. But then on some of the other songs, they're slowing down a lot more and cultivating a little bit more of a darker aura. They're not in full doomy territory, but they're definitely cultivating that kind of atmosphere a little bit more on some of these slower numbers. Um, so it's kind of a weird back and forth uh, with the songs, but they're all quite good. They, they do all of them quite well together. Uh, it's on a small label, and that's a pattern I've also noticed looking at some of these bands from Belgium and the Netherlands, is that in, these bands didn't really get signed to any of the more prominent labels back in the day. You know, they weren't picked up by Noise or Steamhammer over in Germany or anybody. And I think you know that's one reason some of these bands you know really didn't get as much attention. They didn't seem to get into circulation quite as well. They never quite got that break where they were you know licensed out by a Roadrunner or uh, got a good distribution uh, deal with Metal Blade or anything. So you're often looking for you know these kind of you know smaller time releases by smaller time labels, but the Future Tense one is uh, really quality stuff. If you like uh, mid '80s European metal, uh, this is going to be a really good one to check out. And let's see, I haven't seen anyone mention it in the chat yet, but uh, Future Tense. I guess I'll go ahead and spoil the ending. They were featured on one of the Metal Massacre volumes. They're on Metal Massacre Five from Metal Blade. So they got that you know one little whiff of some exposure with a bigger label, uh, but they never got you know a chance to record anything else. And that particular volume is pretty stacked with big name bands. Metal Massacre Five's got Overkill. It's got Fate's Warning. Um, I think Hellhammer's on that one. Uh, Voivod's on that one, I believe. So even though it's a, they have the song Nightmare, and it's a cool track, but I think it just gets a little bit buried because people are so focused on all these other acts. I think Metal Church is also on uh, Volume 5. It's a really loaded volume in terms of having bigger name bands making an appearance. So, but yeah, if you want to check out a really cool Netherlands EP, if you can find a copy of it... Uh, Future Tense is a good one. I'm pretty sure there's an anthology collection that has you know, the EP, some demos, and stuff like that. And so you can always track it down that way as well. Um, the original is something that, yeah, it's on my want list. And someday, hopefully, I can track it down for a relatively sane price. Okay. Yeah, don't know. Never heard of them. Nope. Very very much lost and overlooked. And it's it's a shame. They, they had a really quality album there. Sweet. All right, Marty, what you got next on your list? Well, we're going to stay in the 80s, uh, 1986. This band, this is the only thing I have from them, is their debut album. Um, one thing they have in line um, in common with Sepultura is they're still productive today. They put out um, an album last year. I have not heard it, but this is Volcano's Bloody Vengeance album. Oh, hell yeah. Mm. Awesome. And this, again sloppy but and as opposed to this is more death thrash i think um very sloppy oh there's one of those things in it um but aggressive uh, again i mean brazil just had something in the water i guess if i was that miserably hot all the time i would be mad as hell too and uh writing super aggressive um music that's just kind of teetering on the edge of falling apart Hold on, let me switch you. Yeah, this is the live album, which came out before the actual studio album. Don't know why, but this this is uh, one of the most brutal things you'll ever hear live. Definitely worth checking out. There, there's a CD, I'm sure, but um, Volcano Live. Yep. Yeah. And one thing I got to say about a lot of these early Brazilian death slash thrash bands is you know, other than they all kind of share, they're all in the same um, uh, wheelhouse when it comes to their uh, brand of intensity and uh, death slash thrash, but the production is really underwhelming. You could tell poverty is a thing. It's a thing. I mean, these bands were probably getting recorded whichever way they could, how they could ever get on tape with any money. They just did whatever they could. And all this stuff with a bigger, fuller production would probably had a lot more impact, but as it is, I mean, it just kind of gives it that South American sound. 
which we're going to continue to talk about here as I go down the list. But Volcano, this is a good one for sure. Bloody Vengeance. I think some of the charm might be lost if it was polished. You know, it might be because, I mean, that kind of did define their sound. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You you can use that expression now. Like you're talking about a you know, a modern black thrash band and you go, oh, it sounds South American because it's underproduced. Like you, yep. it's, it's a describing part of it now. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's a very good point, Simon. Okay. Speaking of Simon, we're going to get that gentleman back here. There you go. That's back to me again. We're burning through this. Okay. Um, this is definitely one of the bands that I really, really wish would break out from this country. Um, I don't know anybody outside of Australia that ever talks about them, but they're pretty um, well-respected long-term black metal band uh, in this country, and that's Astrial. Oh, uh, yeah. Now, I have talked about them on one of my videos before. I think I put a sound sample I remember on you them. talking about them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is their 2000 EP, uh, Summoning the Essence of Ancient Wisdom, um, which comes off their demo tape from 98, I think it was, which I've got. Um, this is... Basically, Australia's answer to Abigail. That's really what you get here. Um, it's lots of um, it's furious black metal, but it, it's got a lot of melody. Like there's the dissection, necrophobic, a lot of dawn, that kind of um, sound. But it really feels like um, Abigail to me. Uh, you know, some third album Burzum as well. Um, it's got some sort of slower head banging riffs, which is really good live. Awesome live band. Um, this EP is limited to 500. I, I don't know how you're going to find it. That's the problem with this band is their distribution. This thing was on di dissident records who have been defunct for, I don't know, a decade. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of their stuff, their last two albums have got um, some European pressing, um, so you can probably get them easier. But the early stuff on you know, these EPs, it kind of needs a, a big compilation they, they should just make a compilation CD of all of the EPs because there's about three EPs in a demo. They could easily do a comp. Um, the big track on this one's As Mist Befell the Ruins. Uh, when they play that thing live, it's um, it's just got the, the best head-banging, catchy riff in the middle. It's, it's a sensational track. Um, and uh, on this tour, it's actually got the sticker on the front here, stuck on the front of the case, which um, is the, you know, this is the tour EP, and it tells you where they're going to play. The 19th November, year 2000, at the Iron Duke Hotel, which is the gig I went to um, in support of this, they covered Burzum's Key to the Gate, um, which was great. And they kept the part in where Varg fucks up the drums. They actually <laughs> kept that in live. <laughs> so he misses the snare, and they kept it in. It was so good. Um but uh, they're still active. They haven't written an album since 2010, but they still tour. Um, yeah, good band. Astrial. Check it out. Check them out. Sweet. And the album's good, but that one, that EP is the best. Yeah, that's another one. I don't have anything by them, but I've heard stuff here and there. And yeah, it's a really cool band. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to get their stuff. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, you know, 90% of it's on a small Australian label, and that label's probably defunct. So that's. You know, another label they used was Black Talon Media. I don't think they exist anymore. So mm. very difficult. So you're saying they probably won't have it when I go to Walmart tomorrow? No. No, we won't be able to get it uh, on Amazon either. <laughs> you just have to settle for that boring-ass 3LP Iron Maiden album. Um. Mm. <laughs> or an old copy of Kiss's Sonic Boom. <laughs> they might have those at Walmart tomorrow. They might for $5. Okay. <laughs> Alan. Okay, let's uh, show some vinyl here. And time to switch back over to Belgium with one of my favorite releases from the country. It's the band Ostrogoth. And this is their original EP from 1983, Full Moon's Eyes. Kind of cool cover art concept uh, going on there. Simple but effective. Uh, Ostrogoth was a little more successful than a lot of their country mates. They did get a few albums out after this. I think they did three total, maybe four. Um, a lot of people agree, though, that with each successive release, Ostrogoth got a little tamer 
Yeah, and a little less interesting. So uh, the EP here is fantastic. It actually has a very Swedish sound to it. For comparisons would be things like early Gotham City. Uh, you know, very uh, it's fast but melodic. Um, kind of very rolling song structures. Very, very catchy, uh, high energy stuff. Uh, Full Moon's Eyes, the title track, is great. Rock Fever uh, is very catchy, anthemic metal. Uh, Heroes Museum is a cool one. Paris by Night's a little slower, but still uh, a good track. And yeah, even you know subsequent releases, the first album, Ecstasy and Danger, had good stuff on it. But yeah, as they kept going, you could kind of tell they were running out of steam. But uh, Full Moon's Eyes is uh, very much a good one. It's also a pretty early release if I remember right, on uh, Mausoleum Records, hmm. which was out of Belgium. And you know, this was another thing, as I mentioned before, that you know, sort of limited some of these bands in the Benelux countries, is you didn't have a Noise Records or a, you know, a Peaceville or an Earache or a Metal Blade that really championed the local scene. Mausoleum was the largest one I can think of in terms of a label in that part of Europe. And... It, Mausoleum didn't have a big name roster back in the day. They weren't always looked upon. They were definitely not looked upon as a top tier label. They were very much looked at as sort of a yeah, second or third tier label. It's the kind of label that would pick up new wave of British heavy metal bands on their third album when nobody in the UK would sign them anymore. You know, in this day and age, uh, people look at the Mausoleum roster a lot more fondly because those records were a little more obtainable. Um, if you were getting to hear bands out of that part of Europe, if Mausoleum was the one person that maybe would make it out, you know, beyond the country's borders and have a chance to trickle overseas here and there. So you could pick a few of those things up. And Ostrogoth, yeah, is one of the best of the bunch. So um, start with the early stuff and slowly work your way forward with them. But yeah, the, the early stuff, if you like your first wave of Swedish heavy metal, the classic acts, Ostrogoth's a really good comparison to those. Right on. I am up again. And this is 1987 still. We're right in that same super um, prolific era for Brazilian death thrash. This is Mutilator's Immortal Force. And again, this might be, it's still death thrash, but this is a little on the thrashier side. If you compare this to Volcano, again, you've got a pretty lo fi production. Um, one thing that the charm of this band is they're a little tighter. I think these guys are a little bit tighter than Volcano, for example, and maybe even Sarcophago. There's obviously some chops here. Um, it's, it's really good, solid, evil death thrash leaning on the thrash side. And, you know, this is a gray haze, Cogumelo. I don't know what the gray haze. It's an awesome album. I love it. What's that? I love it. It's a great album. It's a great album. It's really good stuff. Really solid. Um, sounds like Brazil. It sounds like it came from <laughs> Brazil during the 80s. I mean, all this shit is definitely in that wheelhouse. Next up is Simon. Thank you, sir. Just back on the Mausoleum Records, Alan. Um, mm -hmm. This is one thing that always amuses me. This is a movie called Mausoleum. Same logo. Uh. Same and, yep. <laughs> and it's cool. I've never seen that. Yeah. And that's, I mean, the movie poster, the original poster for this thing um, is that. And it's always had that logo. Huh. So I I don't know. What, when was this? The movie was 1982. Okay. Is that, that... recorded in someone's backyard too? <laughs> no, no. This is, this is a, um, uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, That's interesting. I don't know. I don't know what the earliest Mausoleum Records release yeah, was. Yeah, wondering who was first. Yeah, I'll see. Let me see what I can find real quick while you, uh, All right. while you introduce your next one because that's okay. interesting. Never seen. Yeah, it. yeah. It's always made me laugh. That. Um, okay, so the next one I'm going to look at. Um, this is a band that were um, for a period of time huge. Like they got so much Australian airplay, um, and they were on heaps of tours. And I think they had a bit of international support because they were on um rotten records this is damaged uh token remedies research it's really hard to classify them i mean I, metal archives calls them death grind eh, they call themselves hate core 
and although that's a kind of cringy term it actually well describes them because it's just hate the, the the whole thing here is just hate um it would appeal to hardcore fans as much as it would death metal fans that's why it was so well embraced um you know it was part of the melbourne grindcore scene and all those the uh, melbourne grindcore bands but they yeah you know the punk guys liked damaged um the death metal guys like damage it doesn't on this one but on previous eps they they do that punk thing where they replace every second letter with an x so you know it's dx mx you know, whatever mm -hmm. um so uh yeah they, their first album was um no well they, they formed in 92 first album was called do not spit that came out in 93 um, and there's super, super brutal EP called Passive Backseat Demon Engines, which is a great <laughs> name. <laughs> that came out in 95, and that has a battery cover of Equimanthorn, which is not what you'd expect from a death grind band, but anyway. Um, and this thing came out in 97. Like I said, it has huge radio play. We have a, um, and I'll mention it a few times through these CDs, we have a, um, a national broadcaster that's youth-oriented called Triple J, it's FM radio station. They had a metal program um, in the late 90s called The Three Hours of Power, and that's just three hours of metal, and they really played a lot of Australian stuff. So I think it was 10 p.m. every Tuesday night. You get your TDK tape out, hit record, yeah. and it was great. You'd, you'd get so much good stuff. Um, the vocals on this is what really sets it apart. It is unhinged. It is spat out. The vocals, they literally just spat out. It's um, I don't know what to compare it to. It's rabid. The speed that he gets the 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 lyrics out on this thing is crazy. Um, the drummer uh, is a guy called Matt Skitz. He's one of those drummers that plays in like twenty bands, and whenever any Melbourne band needs a drummer, they just get Matt Skitz, and he fills in for live sessions. He's ridiculously good. Um, the one track, if you're going to check him out on YouTube, "Eternal Dismemberment Complex," is a very weird, weirdly put together track um it's primarily drum focused and has these strange pauses in it and then the vocals are just rabid i don't know the, the band is just full of blasts and groove and then random breakdowns like they're very very australian very melbourne grindcore um they that's on rotten records so they share the label with like acid bath and dri which is pretty good for a victorian band um yeah one of the first bands I ever saw, um, the first band I ever saw was Pantera in 1996. And that was like, oh, is this what gigs are? These big things at the giant stadium. <laughs> and then about six months later, I saw Damaged at an all-ages show in a dingy pub that then closed down. Um, and the singer didn't bother showing up. And <laughs> it was a complete <laughs> change to Pantera. Um, but it was a brutal set. And the guitarist, you could tell he felt sorry for the crowd because there's no vocalist. So he tried to do vocals and they weren't great. <laughs> um, album after this one, Purified in Pain, is not a very good album. But what was unique about it is, you know, they're already having problems with the vocalist. He didn't want to even show up on stage. So they got rid of him. They got Kevin Sharp from Brutal Truth to do the vocals. Um, and he came out here and toured that album with his big cowboy hat. Um, it was, Sweat it was a cowboy hat. Yep. Yeah, it was a really, really cool show. And some, I don't know how it happened, but um, somehow I ended up helping Matt Skitz pack his drum kit into the back of the van. And so I got to meet, meet Kevin Sharp briefly. I don't know how that even happened, but that was a fun night. Uh, yeah, damaged. Definitely worth checking out. Right on. Cool. Don't know that one Me either. Alan. All right. Before I do my next one, Simon, so yeah, I checked. It looks like the earliest release from Mausoleum, they did one in 1982. So it was really 1983 when they started putting out a few more titles. So the yeah. movie probably beat the record label. Okay. Um, Interesting. Yeah. They're, maybe there was some kind of parent company that owned both. I, I have no idea. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm going to look into it as well. They yeah. just stole the logo. They said, fuck it, and stole it. <laughs> it, it, I, I, hey, I have no idea what Belgium copyright law is like. Uh, I've been reading a little bit about Belgium this week just out of curiosity while I listen to some of these bands, but I, did, I didn't dig into their copyright uh, <laughs> legislation. Can't say. Apparently it's a bit loose. 
<laughs> I, it, it might be I, something like that. Maybe could be part of the reason that again, Mausoleum maybe didn't again didn't really have the best reputation back in the day. Maybe it's because they ripped off the logo of everybody's favorite local movie. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm making things up now. But uh, what I'm not going to make up is this next band from the Netherlands. Uh, it's one of the best ones that I will mention tonight. It's another one that I'd like to get a copy of and just never have been able to track down. Um, little known band called Proud Existence. And they did a six track, I guess it counts as mini LP called The Trial. Uh, it's from 1988. It's on another little, just nothing. <laughs> going on there? That's a great uh, fucking co cover there. The, the cover kind of looks like something, you know, like a rough draft of a Running Wild Port Royal album cover that they immediately rejected because, yeah, why wouldn't you? But, it was uh, rejected by Satan's Court in the Act. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, they yeah, rejected yeah. that cover and uh, these guys took it. <laughs> they hold yeah. hula hoops or what's going on? <laughs> I, that, that's a mass of their chain together. Okay. With, uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, they're, they're chained and they're awaiting uh, a verdict. Yeah. In the trial, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, y y you know, you're from the Netherlands. You're getting your six-track mini LP put out on uh, Paladin Records. That's spelled with a Y. Um, <laughs> with all those other, you know, luminous uh, metal bands uh, on Paladin. They've put out so many classic releases we all know and love. I don't think you get to argue about your artwork too much. <laughs> Uh, regardless of the you know the uh, maybe not so great cover art, this is one of the best albums I'll talk about tonight. Uh, it has Ooh. a surprisingly good production to it for such you know kind of a small, more limited release. Um, very sharp, traditional European metal sound. Uh, very good songwriting. Uh, very good instrumentation. Nice performances. The songs are varied. It's this is kind of you know, almost the opposite of Acid. Acid, you know, is very straightforward, no frills. Do one thing, very simple, and get it done. These songs are actually a bit longer. They really flesh these out with some different parts and some change it up. Uh, very good energy throughout. Uh, it, it's a yeah. Looking at it, you don't expect much, and you listen to it, it's just like. Is that right? Did I really just hear that? Uh, it's an excellent little release. It's also a little weird in that it didn't come out until 1988. And it does not sound like that. I mm. literally double-checked it on another side. And I was just like, was that really 88? It sounds like it should have come out like in maybe 1985 or 1984. Um, very out of place in the 1988 metal scene. They, like most of these other bands, they did not get much other product out. They did some demos. A lot of these bands demoed a lot in this area, and I'm sure they were just you know practicing and hoping to get a break, and very few did. The only other vinyl output they had was a split 7-inch. Uh, there was a little series done called Metal Power, and they did several volumes, and there were these split 7-inch releases. I think they typically had four bands a piece, but I'm not certain about that. You don't see them very often. They're a little scarce. But um, uh, anyway, yeah, Proud Existence was on the fifth one uh, with some other bands. So that was really the only other time they got something out and about. But yeah, The Trial is as goofy as it looks. Do not uh, Don't bypass it. If you see it, A, it's kind of a pain to find. B, it sounds really good, and C, if you don't like it, you can sell it or trade it to me, and I will take <laughs> it off your hands. So you've really got nothing to lose. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's one of the be in terms of songwriting, it's one of the best things I'll talk about tonight. If there's one complaint, uh, some of the songs do go on a little bit long. Uh, they probably could have trimmed some of the songs back a little bit and had them feel a little tighter. But uh, you know, hey, they still managed to hold them together quite well, even though the songs do run a bit. So, yeah, Proud Existence, another one lost to time and dug back up here on our international metal show this evening. So now, Marty, let's jump back over to you and see what else you've got from the darkest corners of South America. Well, we're going to jump a decade into the future. Not from the future, but from 85. Let's go to 95. And one thing has changed, and that is a better production. But the sloppy aggression is still very much at the forefront of Brazilian death metal. 
That is Christian's Black Force Domain. This Rip album up. is sloppy, but so destructive. Um, unsettling at times. The speed is insane. Uh, power Trio, a couple brothers in this band. I've seen this band probably three or four times over the years. Every time I see them, they so it sounds like you're sticking your head in a jet engine. I mean, it is just, there was no definite, there was, there were only a power trio. There was no definition of the sound. I don't know if it's just a sound guy that doesn't know what to do with a band like this, but it's just a, like you're sticking your head inside a, a blower, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, I mean, I knew, I was familiar with this band. I was familiar with these albums, but I couldn't recognize the songs. I'm looking around at other people who are like singing along and shaking their fists. I'm like, how can you tell what song this even is? Yeah, uh, yep. you know, I guess fuck me then, because I was the one that didn't know this band enough to not know <laughs> where it was. But sloppy abandon, dark, evil riffs, hard. I mean, speed has become. This is when that whole turbo death metal thing was kicking in, where you know drummers had figured out how to blast, and this is an unending blast beat. Black Force Domain is just a a dark, evil, sloppy, good mess that um perfectly represents where they came from i mean brazil i mean this is a if you like teleport to all these bands i've been talking about to the future very similar yeah i need to get that one back i had it in the way back but i think i traded it um i saw them live two years ago and it's ex exactly like you said marty it was <laughs> yeah. um that the, all i heard was triggered double kicks for an hour that was it yeah and then whirlwind <sighs> yep it's very very it. hard three instruments and the the sound people just can't figure it out and it just it was not enjoyable every time i've seen them it i wanted to like it but it just was not enjoyable because there was yep. no definition in the sound yeah that was my experience too yep my experience. all right simon okie dokie i'm gonna stay in the melbourne grind scene um someone should do a document documentary on the melbourne grind scene because it's got its own world down there i don't know why the victorians love their grind but they do um trigger warning for the gory graphic cover art this is a blood duster yeast a good album uh, <laughs> well this is the you, you guys in the states know it as an album i know it as a five track or seven track ep yep so um this originally came out on this little company called dr jim's records i got it on relapse Yes, um, the EP clocks in at 12 whole minutes, and the last three minutes of that is feedback loop. So there's about nine minutes of music on this, um, which obviously is why Relapse picked it up. And Sam issued it with this guy, Fisting the Dead, <laughs> which has the bulk of the tracks. Yep. And they stuck them together, and they just called it Yeast in, in the, on Relapse and made an album out of it. But Yep. Um, yeah, the tracks here, Albert through to Nasty Chicks. <laughs> um, the, I said sadistic execution didn't give a shit. These guys did not give a shit. They, <laughs> no. yeah, um, they got to a point where they were going to get big, um, and they intentionally walked away from it and said, "We don't want to do that. Like, we just want to have this little fun, stupid band." So they disbanded it. Um, which I don't know. It's a bit of a shame. Um, I know a, a couple of people that have tried to um, over the over the years be the um, you know representatives for the band, you know, try and get them booking on tours and stuff. And apparently, it's very difficult to work with them. But uh, anyway, so what you get here is um, groovy grind, I guess is the best way to describe them. Um, yeah. And these seven tra tracks are just outstanding. It's it's pretty brutal. Um, well produced it's got some sound bites because grindcore um i think they all come from bad taste or brain dead um pretty much what they do their, their style is really known as grind and roll uh which is a great description um the the drummer on this is a guy called matt rizzo um really peppery drums he went on whoops one of those that. cases i need to fix <laughs> some some gory stuff there and i don't know what they're doing with that but uh well, there you go. That's what the CD is. Um, need to fix that. Does that mean anything in Australia? No, not that. Mm. No, we've got our own version of it, but um, not that one. Um, yeah, the drummer Matt Rizzo went on to form 
uh, a very big band now called King Parrot. I think they're doing quite well internationally. They're signed to hmm. Phil Anselmo. House 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, but their first album, he did the drums on it, um, and he's in the video clip for um, um, Shit on the Liver, I think is the name of the song, which is a brilliant, <laughs> funny clip. Um, and they, they started off more grind, and they've gotten more house call records over time. Um, but this, yeah, this was great. I've seen them more, more times live than I can count between, like, they were on every single bill from 1998 to 2002, every single... Australian pungent stench. That's not a bad description. That's not actually. a bad description, mm -hmm. but more grind. I quite agree with that. Yeah, um, but same attitude. Songs. Yeah, same attitude. But the some of the, some of the songs don't clock more than thirty seconds. They they definitely stay on the grind side. Yeah, there are songs over you know particularly that um the the fisting album that are like you know forty seconds intro, five seconds of song like Mortician do. Um, really but, full uh, production though. Really heavy guitars. You know, yeah, like, on these tracks, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the other album is pretty rough, but this is is nuts, absolutely nuts. Um, and, uh, yeah, the damaged vocalist I spoke about, he does a, a few lines on track seven on the Nasty Chicks. Um, that's what I mean. The, the Melbourne grind bands were just all one big scene. It's It would be an interesting read, um, and it's still a thing now because, you know, King Parrot's sort of the lead of all that stuff now. Um, one time I saw them play, and they were completely naked. I really didn't need to see that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i mean i just couldn't give a shit <laughs> so yeah blood duster yeast um they did Wait, plenty of albums touring before. clothes clean you don't have to wear them on stage <laughs> yeah i did not need to see that many schlongs <laughs> yep all right alan okay well i'll stick with the uh another dutch band who i'm Pretty sure never performed naked, though I can't verify that at the moment. Uh, this is a band called Vault. They did, again, the, the story is very much the same here. They did one album called No More Escape in 83, and they did a single that came out with it that I always liked. Uh, it pairs up a couple of songs, Hell of a Block and Burning Eyes. Uh, kind of a weird picture sleeve to it. I've got the single. I don't have the album. Um the thing I always liked about Vault Sound compared to some of their contemporaries, they're a bit more rumbly and gravelly in their tone. Uh, you know, not to the point of sounding completely like Motorhead or anything like that. And, and it's not you know just like a poor production. They just had you know a little bit more of a gravelly sound that lended a little bit of weight to the material compared to you know some other stereotypical mid '80s European bands. But yeah, they've got uh, both songs on there are very good. The album's got a lot of good tracks on it as well. Um, there's not a lot else to say to distinguish them. Like a lot of these other bands from the Netherlands, they're on a little record label called NON Records. I'm pretty sure that's a division of you know Time Warner or CBS or <laughs> is uh, Capital or something. It, no one's ever heard of these labels. They didn't have a lot of output. Um, the Vault single was one I picked up on really early when I started collecting vinyl just because I saw the name listed on a sale list and I thought, hell of a block, that's a cool song title. I think I'll buy it. Um, it wasn't very much back then. But uh, yeah, another cool band, a lot of demos, but never got a chance to do a second album, never got you know picked up. And it just seems to be the curse of you know a lot of these bands from these two countries that... The spotlight never quite swung in their direction. Like I mentioned towards the start of the show, I've seen it mentioned you know, in a couple of different articles I've read that a lot of these Belgium and bands from the Netherlands just seemed you know, perpetually stuck in the shadow of Sweden and Germany and the UK. Uh, you know, the, All the press was there, the bigger labels were there, I, the scene was there, and even though there were a lot of quality bands in these countries, they... They never could quite, you know, get you know up to that next tier. Uh, Sinister they just did never okay. got the attention. What's that, Marty? Sinister did okay from the Netherlands. Later on, yes. When you get into the '90s, you know, with some uh, with some death metal bands, Sinister, Pestilence, uh, you know, of course. Uh, you know, some of those acts, you know, yeah, did uh, Asphyx. Pestilence, yeah. Yeah, they had uh, they had a much better run later. Uh, the same is kind of true with. The uh, even in the power metal realms, you know, bands like Delane and Within Temptation, 
have become bigger entities from those countries. But much later on, you know, they're in the early mid eighties. Um, you know, maybe I'm just completely drawing a blank and missing someone, but I'm hard pressed to f come up with a band that, you know, had, it was really a big deal at the time. You know, I've got some that, you know, made multiple records and they're well regarded today, but they're well regarded by, you know, fans like us that dig a little deeper into the history of things. Yeah. They're not ones that are going to get played on Sirius XM, you know, Ozzy's Boneyard or Liquid Metal or anything like that. They're too busy playing Metallica the whole damn week, which I absolutely hate. Yeah. My commute has not been fun. Thank you very much, Liquid Metal. <laughs> Stop playing Metallica. <laughs> I got there, way off track there. It <laughs> isn't just Liquid Metal. Metallica is commonly played on probably five different channels. It is, but when you've got you know three or four channels to you know flip through, you can find a non-Metallica song. But yeah, when you've got one station that's nothing but Metallica twenty four seven, your options on the other two or three stations it can be kind of meager sometimes. But anyway, getting back on track, yeah, Vault they have gotten the anthology treatment, so you can uh, get No More Escape. That's got the single tracks with it. Uh, it's got a lot of the demo tracks with it. Uh, so you don't have to hunt down the you know kind of hard to find obscure early vinyl stuff. You can just track down the anthology instead. And yeah, th they're a cool band. They deserved you know a little bit more of a break. They weren't doing anything very original, but they were what they were doing. They were doing quite well. Awesome. Over to you, Marty. What you got next? Nineteen ninety nine. This could be the brother band to Christian, and that's Rebellion. Burn the Promised Land. Very much in the same style as Christian. Uh, one thing that sets them apart is Rebellion are much tighter. Um, the riffs are a little clearer to me. A little clearer is a little more uh, better executed. Ugh, I have a fruit fly buzzing around here. It's driving me absolutely crazy. Um, <laughs> I haven't spun this in a long time. I mean, I got this as a promo back in 99. And um, I just put it on this week to refamiliarize myself, and I like it way better today than I did when it came out. It, when it came out, it just seemed like it was kind of derivative of you know Christian and other bands trying to mm. glom onto that style. But now I just, especially after listening to Christian, it just seems like a more formed, a more realized uh, evolution of what Christian started. Very good stuff. There isn't a lot of slop here. It's really well produced, hard hitting, super fast. Uh, same same blasting style. I don't know if that's a hammer blast or what the hell you call that technically, but um, absolutely great death metal. Burn the Promised Land Rebellion. I completely forgot about that band. I remember that logo quite a bit, but and goofy spelling. <laughs> yeah, right, Ray, rebellion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Simon. Okay, it's back to me. I'm going to show some ACDC for... Uh, no, I'm not. It's being requested in the comments. It shall be denied. <laughs> How do we sleep while our beds are burning? All right, thank you, Houston. <laughs> I, um, hmm. yeah. si si Simon, want to join me for a, uh, a live stream on your channel for a while? Yep, next or up. We'll, 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 we'll let Marty do his thing NXS. here. I don't know what he's doing, but we're just going to leave him be and not make eye contact as we quietly slip out. <laughs> That's um, not in excess. No, neither is this band, which is the best segue I can hope for right now. Um, this is uh, a band that I don't think many outside of the country know about. This is oh. Ignibimus. Yeah, yeah, I've got one or one of their CDs, actually. Yep. Hmm. This, uh -huh. this is a CD. So nuclear war, <laughs> yep, nuclear war now were obviously huffing the paint when they did this one. I don't know why they did it, um, but it's slightly annoying. But anyway, this is a death transmutation. Um, Ignivimus, man, they won. They really won out at picking band names. Like so many band names, like once you've done immolation, incantation, suffocation, what's left? Ignivimus. It's Latin. It's Latin for vomiting fire. Now that's the most metal damn thing I've heard in years. Vomiting yeah. fire would have been cooler than ignivimus. <laughs> I brought uh, you down to my level. Welcome. <laughs> oh man. Um, 
but yeah, these these guys play from that same songbook of the of the Shun bands, uh, Incantation, Immolation, uh, Dead Congregation. It's that kind of dark death metal, black and death metal. Um, but hugely from uh, the other Australian band, uh, Abominator, who have been around since the mm. 90s. Um, they share the same drummer, a guy called Chris Volcano. Uh, Volcano and Vomiting Fire, there you go. Uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's one of those guys that's drummed for you know thousands of Melbourne bands, Cemetery Urn, Denouncement Pyre, another great band. Um, pummeling riffs, it's fast, it's bordering on being bestial, black death at times. Um, three albums so far, but this is my favourite. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're on Nuclear War now, so they're getting a bit of a bit of a thing, but it doesn't push them as much as other bands. Um, I really wish that they would get a bit more a bit more love. Um, yeah, so CD in a 7-inch pack, it's infuriating. Oh, but, uh, yeah, fantastic band, Ignivimus. Awesome. Is that, it seems like the CD I had, if I remember right, it's been 100 years since I've listened to it. Was mm. it Drum Machine? Or just the drummer? No, that's Chris Volcano. He's just a nuts drummer. Okay. Yeah. Definitely real drummer. Okay. Brutal fast. Alan, you're back. Oh, uh, one question. Uh, Jen Hook is asking. It's very the, on all of our minds. It's called the Coriolis effect. And I learned that from The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> How would they know if it flushes backwards? Because that's the only way they've seen it ever flush. It's not like they, you can teleport to my house and watch it go down, you know. See, so it's hey, you that's going back. Marty, going the it's, it's called YouTube. You can watch people flush. Really? Is that a thing? I don't want to search those channels. Hey, yeah, I, I'm gonna, yeah I'll, let, I'll let you uh, figure out if that is a thing or not, M Mr. Uh, one Man in One Glass Jar video there. Yeah, I have, I have other awful things that I occupy my time with on, on uh, the internet. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not going to add that to uh, my uh, browsing history. Uh, no. <laughs> My, 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 there's a decent chance my wife is watching this in the other room. So, uh, <laughs> hey, sweetie, not searching for that. <laughs> All right. All right. Ah, so we're back to me. All right. Next up, let's talk probably the most prolific band that I came across from, again, 80s era Belgium and Netherlands. This is a Dutch band. I'm being really good and not saying Holland, you'll notice, sticking to calling it the Netherlands like I'm supposed to. Uh, there is a band called Picture. Not the most heavy metal of titles you could pick for your moniker, but they cranked out about seven albums through the 80s, and they were on a pace of about one per year, so they pretty much kept up with a lot of the noise bands. Uh, the one that I always liked was their fourth album, which is called Eternal Dark. So, now, the band may, may not be great, but they at least came up with an okay logo, and they got a metal as fuck cover art for a change. And Eternal Dark's a pretty cool name for an album. So, yeah, okay, we're, we're working here. Uh, picture is you know, very, very standard issue European traditional heavy metal. You know, they're very much, you know, borrowing, you know, some basic pages from the Iron Maiden and Accept kind of playbooks. Uh, very straightforward songwriting, but good. Uh, they were on a label called Backdoor Records. I think they did all seven releases on that. Uh, and again, this uh, is the band I've seen that had you know the most consistent output from one of these countries, that they actually got all these LPs out and kind of kept banging them out. I've seen people comment that the LPs, again, kind of lose steam over time. I've only heard a few of the early ones. I have not listened to all seven of them. I think Eternal Dark's the last one I have heard. Uh, it's got some good tracks on it. Their one claim to fame later on is that the title track off this album got the Hammerfall treatment. Hammerfall covered Eternal Dark as a B-side on you know an EP or a single at some point. So a lot of people picked up on the song there. And so, you know, Picture did get their 15 minutes of fame belatedly, you know, thanks to the uh, the cover version treatment. Yeah, Hammerfall did a decent version, but it is a really good song. Uh, it's one of Picture's better ones from the albums that I've heard. Uh, again, there is nothing flashy about it. There is nothing that you know distinguishes them. There's nothing that they were trying to do that was very unique or very different. They just did a very good, very solid job of playing traditional 
European heavy metal structures. This is before you know a power metal as we know it today had become a thing. Uh, there's no thrash leanings or speed leanings in their music whatsoever. It's four four time signatures, choruses you can sing along to, good leads, good riffs, good tight compact songwriting. Uh, picture you'll come across their albums every now and then. I don't think they're unless they've gone way up in price recently. They've never been particularly expensive. It's not a band that is deemed very collectible or anything, but you can certainly do worse. It's it's the kind of thing if you see it in the used bin uh, or at a record show and it's only a few bucks, yeah, it's worth picking up and giving a spin if that's your uh, style of metal. Uh, don't overlook them just because the band's name is kind of generic and lame. It sounds fun. Hey, that's a good way to put it, Simon. A lot of these bands are a fun listen. You know, mm. They're the kind of thing, if you're in the wrong mood, you're going to put it on and think, ah, that's just another you know, very generic throwaway kind of Euro metal band. But if yeah. you're in the right mood, like we are here tonight, where we're just having fun, having a beer, taking it easy, then, yeah, it's just like, hey, yeah, that's actually quite, you know, that's good. That's a fun listen worth checking out. You're not going to play it constantly. It's not going to be your top 25 of all time, but it's a very fun listen. That's a great description. It sounds like one of those bands would be impossible to Google, like Metal Picture. Yeah, great. <laughs> yep. Aaron, yeah, there, there, are, there are some of these that have been a pain to dig up information on because um, we'll, we'll get to another one in a little while that I couldn't even, it gave me trouble finding it on Metal Archives because the name was so generic. <laughs> Let me guess, uh, Aaron, the metal theologian, uh, you used to live in Columbia as well. <laughs> Guys lived everywhere. Hey, anyway, he, hey, it's, he, he should be in the chat because it is International Metal Night and he's about as international as uh, the. Uh, YouTube heavy metal community comes. <laughs> so glad you're with us tonight, Aaron. It's yeah. always uh, always fun to see you in the chat. Okay, next up for me goes back to the year I graduated high school, 1989, from a Brazilian band that started with a demo in 1981. So out of all this stuff, these guys are certainly the oldest. Uh, I think the last they put out was 2014. Yep, though the um, archive still says that they're still active. But that is Ratos de Parau with Brazil. I showed this during the uh, Roadrunner stream we did. I used to have the album that came after this as well, Anarchophobia. I don't know what happened to it. But um, hardcore from Brazil, but they're, this is kind of a crossover with more of the metal stuff that came out. I know I bought this along the same times I bought Beneath the Remains. Um, they're just there on the shelves at the same time and it's good fun stuff really good well done hardcore with a metal edge and again these guys have been around for a long time and it's good to see them still turning out music and it was really cool to hear um, the style of crossover you know I was still I was very much into the crossover stuff like accused DRI all that stuff. And this fits in really nicely, but with a Brazilian South American flavor, very yeah. good stuff. The only song I know from them is the one that they played with Sepultura, which I think was Cruciados Pelo Sistema, I think is what it was called. Uh, let me see if it's um, on this one. Sepultura card, put it on one of their EPs and okay. it's on, on a live video. They get the singer from that band and they do it on stage. They Sony must, have, I think they toured together a little bit. Yeah, they would have. Didn't they? Yeah. Hey, yeah. I do want to say hello to all 50-some people watching tonight. Thank you so much for sticking with us on a Friday Ooh. night. And Simon is up next. It's He's the reason me. why you're all here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's Saturday lunchtime over here. I'm getting hungry. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. What's for Tinnies. lunch in the future, Simon? Tinnies. What's lunch in the future? Um, What's for lunch in the future? I don't know. I'd have to go out and like look for stuff. Um, mm. I haven't worked it out yet. I've got some some peppermint lollies back there. That that might be it. <laughs> um, uh, okay, this next one is a band that um, I think have a little bit of a cult following outside of Australia um, because you couldn't get the album until 2017 when it was reissued um, by um, uh, the Crypt put this thing out, but. Up until then, it was 20 years of only this Warhead Records pressing. This is Misery, Rebel in Blasphemy, Queensland band. Um, this is 
super, super evil, massive sounding death metal, uh, rumbling bass, dive bomb guitars. It's an album like this is is why they use the term crushing. This is crushing death metal. Um, it's like I said, it came out in '97. It had um, a lot of radio play. The song one on here called uh, "Dark Inspirations." Um, that track was played on that three hours of power every single Tuesday night for three years straight. You were guaranteed <laughs> to hear that song. Um, it never got old because it was so supremely heavy. Um, opens with a demon snarl and then that just kicks straight in uh, with a track called God Speak. Um, there's no little kiss on the cheek. It's 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 rough pounding the whole time. <laughs> this is a crazy, <laughs> crazy thick, heavy album. Um, the last track is called Revel in Blasphemy and is the entire album played backwards. So it gets old pretty quick, but um, <laughs> it, it was a bit of a laugh at the time. Um, the previous album they did was called um, uh, A Necessary Evil. Uh, that was great, had a different vocalist. Doesn't sound like this. It was definitely lighter in production. It sounded more like Sinister's Diabolical Summoning. This is a beast unto its own uh, misery with so heavy live um they reform and play live shows every now and then but the band is technically defunct um did two more albums after this uh which were good but this is still the best one um so yeah you you can now get it by the crypt on lp and on cd should be pretty easy to get but yeah it was 20 years of not being able to get this thing uh, because warhead records i'll talk about them a little bit later it's a sydney-based record company um and they went defunct in about 99 so okay very difficult to get the stuff misery awesome sweet alan all right well uh i will see your uh <clears throat> fiendishly evil and uh brutal unknown release and uh i'll see you in hell which is the title of the next uh album here crossfire with uh, perhaps not the most evil or intimidating album cover <laughs> of all time. <laughs> that thing rolls. <laughs> that, 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 you see that cover, whatever you remember about tonight, you'll remember this fucking album cover until the day you die. It looks like a slippery slide. The, the same like, it, it, looks like, it looks like something from a fucking Scooby-Doo cartoon. It does. It's like, it's like row, Shaggy, there be ghosts inside the giant lit up Halloween skull. <laughs> I can't do Scooby-Doo, but I tried. That's pretty um, cool. Yeah, this is one everybody. This is one again. The band didn't do a ton of stuff. Uh, the album uh, has its ups and downs, but everybody remembers it because of that crazy skull on top of the Aztec pyramid, which is so very emblematic of you know Belgium heavy metal in yeah. 1983. Yeah. Uh, these elements just fit together like peanut butter and jelly. That's a 1983 <laughs> album. This is a 1983 album. It is. That's a very modern looking cover for 1983. I doesn't it look modern? Um, I don't. I, know. I don't know. I'm just going to stick with my Scooby Doo thing and leave it at that. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it's Scooby Doo. I mean, it's stupid subject matter, but I mean, the the actual look of it is very modern. I don't know. Anyway, okay. go ahead. Looks Sorry. Like a bumping orange. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's, you know, you know, with just a little work, they probably could have made this work better. This is one I did used to have, but I let go. Mm. You know, if they had just made the skull, you know, look like a, a normal skull chiseled out of stone or something, <laughs> the cover would probably work okay. You know, it could have had you know a little bit of a you know metal vibe to it. And yeah, and, instead they turned it into something you know kind of prop from Chuck E. Cheese. I you gotta wonder what the heck they're doing again. Mausoleum. I seem to have some quality control issues maybe early on. And again, this is listed as like the second metal release on Mausoleum, the first thing they did in 83. Anyway, what the heck does Crossfire sound like? Uh, interestingly, they sound a lot like Accept. They were very much borrowing from the German playbook more so than some other Belgian bands at this point. Uh, the intro track to the album, the first uh, you know few passages of it, are dead ringer for Iron Maiden circa Number of the Beast. I mean, I put the I, I played it this week, first time in ages. And I put it on, and me was just like, is this an Iron Maiden record? Did I pull the wrong thing out or pull up the wrong thing? Nope. It's just the intro to Crossfire. See you in hell. 
Uh, but after that, yeah, it's got a strong dose of you know classic accept in the music. Um, there's you know elements of Motorhead, so you put those things together, and you're getting something that you know has a little bit more of a rough and ready sound to it. Uh, it's again fairly well produced. These bands didn't, often didn't have any you know, poor sound quality on their recordings. Um, they're not doing anything original. They're very much staying in that particular wheelhouse with their accept. But again, it's good, fun, headbanging music. You can get drunk, bang your head, uh, stare at that skull and get really freaked out over it and try and figure out what the hell was going on. Um, it's one that, yeah, is just a fun listen and you know, it has this very you know unintentionally iconic album cover from you know, the cheesy end of things. But not a bad listen. The, um, I'm trying to remember. I feel like the band did something. They may have gotten the reunion bug at some point. Let me double check real quick. See, both uh, the first two albums are on my want list. I actually added them to my Discord list uh, last week. They're really good. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they did have one more album, and I think it was a Mausoleum release too. Yeah, uh, which again features the second attack. Has that same damn skull from a yeah. different perspective on it. It's, it's that Eddie. You got to have a mascot in the '80s, and uh, boy, these guys had a mascot. Uh, I'm going to call him Scully McNoggin, uh, <laughs> and uh, you're stuck with it now. I have to look at that cover, and we have to call it Scully McNoggin. Have that Mad Ball. I used to have the same one, and the green one with the eyeball popping out. Yeah. Cool. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you want a really solid chugging, uh, head banging fair. The Crossfire album again is one that, as a mausoleum release, is not that hard to find or yeah, it's solid. pick up the pick up the you know, reissues and such. Here's a question for Alan: Is a Doomstone song "See You in Hell" a Crossfire cover? Probably, if so, killer cover. I, it probably is. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I'll bet it is. Um, I guess one other one I'll mention. There's. It's funny because uh, the album title itself pretty derivative. More than one person has pointed out that Grave Dig, uh, not Grave Digger, Grim Reaper, you know, had an album come out in '83 with the exact same album title. Yeah, and there's you know, there's you know, definitely hints of that kind of you know, new wave of British heavy metal style in mixed in with Crossfire too. So probably not a coincidence that uh, you know, the have you know, an album title that sounds like Grim Reaper, uh, a, a band and vocalist that's trying to sound a more than a bit like Except. They're wearing their influences on their sleeve, and uh, they're wearing a giant skull on top of their pyramid. I can, I can dig it. <laughs> okay. okay, Alan showed something fun. I'm going to show something fun. And my first introduction to this band was my friend S. Craig Zoller was here a couple years ago, hanging out, and he insisted on playing this for me under the um, guidance of. This is the only band he has heard of that could throw down with Lost Horizon, which many of you who watch my channel have seen me talking uh, at end about uh, Lost Horizon from Sweden. They put out two albums, Awakening the World and Flame to the Ground Beneath, some of the best power metal ever written. And um, watching S. Craig Zoller air guitar to this entire album on our way to get ice cream is maybe part of the charm of this, but... It's Hy Hybria, Hybria, I don't know how you say it, defying the rules. Make yourself big, Marty. Oh. <laughs> that would be a different kind of video. Here we hey. go. <laughs> hey, now. Okay. Hybria, defying the rules. Now, I laughed openly at the stupid, uh, you know, headbanger with the, the lead pipe on a motorcycle taking on other guys. And, you know, you got the, the headbanger standing triumphant. Um, in his so gang metal. of motorcycle heathens. But, man, Zoller is right, mostly. Of the technicality of this power metal is along the lines of Lost Horizons Awakening the World. The guitar work mm -hmm. on this thing is amazing. Really yeah. well done bass work, really shred, but not, um, um, not out of control shred. The shred has got a lot of melody and memorable qualities about it. This is a great record, and this band has got um, a handful of full links, and their their last one came out in 2018. 
And I heard they've changed their style a little bit. So I've never investigated further because I would want more of this, to be honest. So this is another Brazilian band. Everything I've shown tonight has been Brazilian. That's going to change here soon. But yeah. um, absolutely great power metal band, power metal album, aside from mm -hmm. the stupid fucking cover art and artwork that goes throughout this whole thing. This yeah. is definitely one you need to track down. The musicianship is exceptional. The singer is exceptional. It is great mm -hmm. power metal. Very European sounding. Um, well produced. I don't know what more to say about it. If you like Lost Horizon, check out this band. Yeah, that That is an incredible album, Marty. I'm glad it's on your stack. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah everything's about it. The thing that I really like about that album, that band, they have this very triumphant sort of epic vibe, but they also have a very blue collar sound yeah. to their metal. They're, they're not going over the top with, you know, this, you know, neoclassical flourishes and, you know, they're avoiding the rhapsody and the Stradivarius traps yep. of European power metal. They're keeping it, you know, at a very much more of a street level. And while the cover art is, yeah, a little goofy, it kind of, you know, portents that a little more than a little bit. There's no castle. There's no dragon. There's no sword. There's no He-Man the Barbarian ripoff. Nope. It, it, it looks like, you know, something that, you know, again, is meant to have more of a street level vibe about it. And it does, but it also just has this glorious triumphant epic oh. uh, vibe through it as well. So it's good. really, really solid. Um, they did change styles over time because they had some, I believe they had some lineup changes and it definitely, coincided with a style shift the second album is still pretty solid is it it's okay? not as, it's not as good as that one but it is still a good album and it, they had a live album come out which was quite good and and then i think it's the next studio album if i remember right where they they kind of lost some of that you know unique elements the third album wasn't bad but it felt very plain compared to the first two it's I still have it on the shelf. I'll take it out every now and then. Not a bad listen, but they, they don't have that big, epic, you know, fist in the air, triumphant vibe to them anymore. They they just start sounding a little bit dull and a little bit redone. But uh, yeah, the, the, at least the second one. The second one's called Skull Collectors. It has much, much more terrible artwork than the one you just showed. <laughs> but uh, it, it is a solid album. They oh, I know what it is too. The third album is they get the songs are actually very very dense they're the they take those longer songs and they compact it all down into like three and a half minute song structures it it works fairly well so i think it's maybe the fourth album then that they lost the plot on um, i will say if, if any of you out there are familiar with uh, awakening the world by lost horizon the song on there welcome back that very much remind that super amazingly catchy technicality is what this kind of aspires to be is it as good as lost horizon maybe maybe i mean i think lost horizon just has better songs but these guys are certainly in the same in the same sphere of influence very yeah good. um riot's thunder steel is also not a bad reference point yeah yeah uh, for that album um that yeah again it has you know, it's just really, you know, almost over the top power metal, but really, but still very strong and not, not power metal in the foo foo. I'm crying <laughs> over my lost dragon companion in the enchanted forest <laughs> while the elves dance and play the flutes around is kind of crap. It's very much in the kind of, you know, yeah, I want to ride my motorcycle right over your fucking skull and we're going to chant glory be while I do it. Yeah. <laughs> I like Hibria. I'm glad you showed that one. Yeah, no, great, great. I was when I started looking up South American bands that came up. I'm like, holy shit, that's a great album. I'm glad yeah. I picked South America. I was most excited to talk about this one. Yeah, I, I'm overdue to talk about some you know South American power metal with Hibria, Viper, Angra. The, the, there's a video in the works. So it'll, it'll happen eventually with some of those bands. There, there's a good power metal scene, and it's. People do forget about that. They could just like most of your titles. We really think of South America for the brutal stuff. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, they have other bands and other styles that are also very, very good. Yep. Okay. Simon. Going to show some Australian power metal. <laughs> no. <laughs> the only band I know that's power metal out here is Dungeon. That's the only band I've ever known of. I don't know if you know them, Alan. The power metal band Dungeon. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, I know the band. Mm. I'm trying to think. If I feel like it may be one anymore. or two others, but I'd have to I'd have to double check. Some Pegasus, things I think, is a band. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'm not too familiar with that scene, but I don't want to incur your wrath any longer. So here's an Arm and Angel album. There we go. 
Yep, there we nice. go. Um, Angel of the Six Order, the only full length that they managed to put out. Um, they did plenty of demos and EPs, um, and they got progressively more and more heavy as they went on, as well you know, Alan. Um, started more of a traditional heavy metal band, added a bit more thrash to it, and then we ended up getting um, a bit more death metal. Um, and it's not death metal when you think of, you know, like Misery, like I just shown. It's not in that spectrum. It's um, sort of like a straightforward bolt thrower kind of thing, but not as chunky. Mm-hmm. They've got that heavy metal influence that they just keep, you know, so it's it's heavy metal death metal or something like that. Um, but they're also... You can you can tell there's the influence from other Australian sort of black and speed metal bands. You can feel that in the production; they get that black speed metal kind of vibe. Um, if you want a non-sketch Argosolin, Armored Angel is not a bad comparison, especially on this album. Um, that's how I feel about it. It's really really solid. Um, they're from Canberra, which is in the ACT, Australian Capital Territory. That's the uh, state where all the politicians live so they're surrounded by politicians um which uh, poor poor guys probably why they broke up um yeah they they solid band that anybody with a denim jacket liked this band it was and they had the patch everyone had an arm and angel patch if you had a blue denim jacket it was guaranteed you would have it just one of those bands that were um seen leaders for so long didn't really break out of the country but um very well respected band by um anyone into metal in australia um they found band. yeah they're a great band um you can kind of in, see in, where destroyer 666 got a little of their their influence from i mean there's well that's that's influence. what i mean there's the um that little bit of that black speed metal thing and denim jackets and bullet belts and all that kind of thing you know leather jacket stuff yeah they even look like destroy there right yeah right on um, yeah absolutely um arm and angel were very influential um they um founded a metal festival in 1991 called metal for the brain um mm-hmm. so a, a local teenager in in um in canberra um became quadriplegic after trying to stop a bar fight um had a you know obviously brain damage from that and um so the guys put together a uh, charity concert. First year was just a, a few small bands. Proceeds went to the um, to the family. Um, and then that, I'll kind of talk about it a bit more after the next band who were related as well. But um, they, they kept that tradition up, Metal for the Brain. So, yeah, mm-hmm. Armored Angel, great stuff. Um, it's a shame that they didn't do more. Yeah. It would have been nice to see where they would keep going. But, uh, yeah, great band. Great yeah. band. Yeah, one of my one of my yeah just pet bands and always has been uh anybody that wants a deep dive on their discography i've got a video yes. it's an older video on my channel where i talk about them for about an hour yeah um, indeed do check that video out yeah they're they're one of the very few bands i even pretend to be completist about if it has armored angel's name on it and it's a reasonable price i'm going to buy it i have way too many pressings of the same albums and the same mm-hmm. demos but they were a really special band they had a very cool unique sound and uh it's very unique a, a lot of um mm, a, a, a lot of australian bands that are, are around now like i'm thinking of bands like um sacrifix and innsmouth um have this sound that is very armored angel and it's the australian metal sound mm-hmm. um yeah another member very, of uh, misery zoman in sacrifix just saying. There you go. Stop <laughs> trying to make <laughs> misery happen, Marty. It's not going to happen, Marty. <laughs> I could go over and get it, but you know, it's all the way over there. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking bug. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah, Armored Angel. I mean, they also, you know, they were a very early band on the Australian metal scene. Their roots go back yep. to at least '85, if not. Yeah, they were earlier. there with Slaughter Lord, and uh, yeah, mm-hmm. in the very early days. Yeah. The uh, oh shoot, Mortal Sin and Mortal stuff. Sin. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I actually should have shown a Mortal Sin tonight, but uh, uh, I decided not to. They're, they're, everybody knows Mortal Sin, I'm pretty sure. Quite all right, quite all right. Okay, Alan. Okay, well, let's go back to the Netherlands. Uh, another 1988 release that's quite good, and it, this one gets some love you know, when you get into the, you know, the deeper corners of the underground. Um, it's a band called Leader. Yeah, have fun Googling that one. Uh, but they made this one album called Out in the Wasteland. 
uh, pretty distinctive black and white cover with you know red logo. It's exactly the kind of thing that the uh, Dan and the guys over at the, the Corrosium website will absolutely go nuts over. Is that Jesus? Uh, <laughs> uh, I <laughs> Jesus, Mad Max, may, some combination thereof. Not sure. That's all I like to think of Jesus with a cape. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think of Jesus as like a trapeze artist. <laughs> what? Wait, we're doing Will Ferrell movies now. Something's going horribly wrong. Ah. Eject, eject. <laughs> Once again, backing out slowly, not making any eye contact. <laughs> Good night, everybody. But anyway, back to leader. The story here is you know, almost depressingly the same. Several demos worth of material, you know, from 1985 up to 1987. I, you know, they finally got a chance to record, you know, this one album. It was a very limited release. It's on, wait for it, Top Hole Records. <laughs> Not that. Uh, they at least weren't in on bottom hole records because I'm guessing that would be worse. Uh, but I'm not sure it could have been you know much further down the chain. Well, depends on how you look at it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. This is going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> when you're on top hole records, you definitely try to work your way up still. <laughs> or work your Good way down. You start at the top, work your way down. Anyway, uh, well, <laughs> apparently they worked their way down pretty quick because they never got anything else out. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> this, <laughs> um, yeah. all, all joking and such aside, it's a really good album. It is surprisingly strong. It's the kind of album where again you're not sure what to expect, but it looks promising and it does deliver. <laughs> um, the the theme stays very much the true. Uh, another Netherlands band that is they're not trying to break the mold. They are not trying to innovate and you know be the next big thing. They are very much copying you know the present big thing from the mid '80s. But they do it very very well. It's a tight album, uh, good songwriting. Production on this one could maybe use a little tweaking. It sounds a little little low, just a little muffled. Maybe it's just the digital copy I have. It's another one. I've never seen a copy of it in the wild. I've never really had a chance to pick it up. But uh, very strong. There's a lot of talent on display in the instrumentation and the vocals. These guys knew how to write songs. And uh, they are a footnote. There's a footnote with one of the members of Leader. I believe it's the guitarist. Let me double check real quick. But uh, I think it's Oscar Carr. Yeah, Oscar Carr, the guitarist on this Leader album, did go on and play on the very first God Dethroned album, um, hmm. which is an album that most people overlooked. Most people got introduced to that band on their second album, Grand Grimoire. Yeah. But they had a previous album, and Oscar played guitars on that one. So... There was a little footnote there. He didn't, to my knowledge, he did not perform on the which, second which one. one. Did he play on the first grand, uh, the first one? Yeah, right. he played on the first one, the, the one Christ he, Hunt. Yes, Christ Hunt. Could yeah. not think of the name of it. Which one's the Ravenous? Why am I thinking of that? That's the third one. Third one, is it? Okay. There you go. But yeah, it's just another good example of one of these, you know, uh, obscure, you know, Dutch bands that didn't get the break they should have. This is another one that sounds a little out of place for 1988. Uh, this sounds like it should have been a 1984 release. Uh, and it would have fit in with the scene much better. But it's another very fun listen. It's a, a solid band. If they had been on a little bigger label, if they'd been part of the German scene, uh, they probably would have, you know, gotten at least a couple more albums out and have you... A much higher profile in the heavy metal history books than they do, but it's a good one to check out. Okay, I'm staying with fun, and this, you know, as Jason Hook so um, much proclaimed in the uh, chat that I I like Halloween, believe it or not, and mm -hmm. I was watching something about Halloween on YouTube one night, and. A video, a live video popped up of Kai Hansen singing with this band. I had never heard the band before. And if it were 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have liked this band. But I've let go of my my uh, hangups with power metal. And I'm all in these days. And I want to talk about Brazil's Angra, Temple of Shadows. Kai Hansen actually ha sings uh, along with the singer on one of the songs on this album. 
Mm -hmm. It's quite good. This came out in 2004, if I remember right. Yes, 2004. This is the only anger I own. This also has Kiko. Uh, I'm going to butcher his name. His name is... Uh, oh, I somehow got on the wrong thing. Kiko, he's in Megadeth now. <laughs> oh, Romino yeah. Or, really, um, he's really good. He is an amazing guitar player. Mm. Uh, Kiko Lauriero? Lauriero? I don't know. He's in Megadeth now. I don't know if he's still doing Anger or not, but this is a great power metal album. I was really kind of blown away by how good this is. Um, I remember hearing Anger back in the day, and I thought it was just a little weak for me, but no, it's really strong, powerful, really complex uh, riffs, amazing guitar work. Kai Hansen's on it, which is always a plus. Um, again, I am not really super familiar with the power metal scene that came out of South America other than these two bands, and it's, wow, both of them are exceptional. I will be investigating more of this band's stuff. If they're good or if they get worse or were better in the past i don't know let me know but that's a good album for sure yeah anger is an interesting one they were formed by a uh, former viper uh vocalist andre matos i just bought that viper album by the way i saw it in the theater of faith yeah, yeah yeah because yeah. of your recommendation i can't wait to hear it i didn't pull it out for this because i didn't think about it. i haven't listened to it yet so yeah it's a cool album uh you could very much tell andre wanted to go in sort of more of a sort of again neoclassical power metal direction and the rest of viper wanted to go in more of a straightforward metal direction so they had to part ways um anger's catalog is there's a lot of there's good albums in it. There's not necessarily a ton of really. St I felt like they never quite made that one you know perfect album that would define them. But um, if you like Temple of Shadows, yeah, you'll like some of the other ones from around that same era. Um, they were pretty consistent around that time frame. You know the the, the reviews on Metal Archives. Not that that's a good litmus test, but there's nothing less than eighty eight percent. Yeah, they're, they're very they're a very consistent band. If you like the sound and you like the style, they're pretty good. Um, they do tend to be on the lighter side of the power metal spectrum. They're not crying over their fallen dragon companion in the enchanted forest with the elves dancing around them, but they do have songs about like Emily Bronte novels. So <laughs> you know, they they do they. they they're kind of adjacent to the Enchanted Forest. They're in the next zip code over every now and then. So they're, cl they're clutching to the poles. A, a, a tad. They um, not motorbikes. Not not motorbikes. They're 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 definitely riding Vespas. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but they have some good stuff. Um, but it, it's a catalog. I would I would recommend Marty if you if you want to follow up on them. Don't bulk buy everything by Angry at once. Take your time and kind of pick through the catalog because you may get to a point where you feel like, yeah, I've heard enough of these yeah, and you don't need any more. No, I, but, I uh, just saw the one, the one song with Kai Hansen. It was live and it was great. It was a great mm -hmm. aggressive song. I'm like, wow, this is, yeah. I'm going to check out this album. They are very good musicians. Uh, you know, they were good songwriters. It's just that, yeah, sometimes you, you do have to, you know, have a, a tolerance for a little bit of that lighter stuff. I actually, it was a band I knew a lot about because I knew Viper and about the time they split up when, um, uh, Anger was coming out. I was actually a member of the Anger fan club for a while. I have a couple of their old, you know, the mailing things. I got. I actually ordered their original demo tape. Uh, yeah, the patch and the armband. Back in the day, they the did not have patches or armbands. Um, <laughs> they didn't have this little pastel floral brooch of a thing. No, I'm, I'm those, totally uh, kidding. They, they have some of those uh, tattoos that you like stick on yourself, and <laughs> they wash off after a week. Yeah, just like check it out, Anger. What is that? Like, anger. Oh, uh, the aim washed off the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, but but no, a, a good band with a lot of good albums. I felt like they just they never quite got you know that one spectacular album. If I had to pick, you know, I really I think their first album, Angels Cry, maybe came the closest. But other folks may think again that one's also a little more on the foo foo end of things compared to some of the later ones. See, that's what anyway, I'm of. But this one doesn't have a lot of foo foo. If it does, it's tasteful foo foo. It's tasteful. Again, they they toned that down a little bit after they did the first album. Had more of those elements. The second album, if I remember right, was sort of a concept album. It had sort of a loose storyline about Magellan or something like that. 
<laughs> and, and then by like the third or fourth album, they kind of they dispensed with a little bit of that and you know kind of tightened things up a little bit more. And that's where you got into a, a good series of albums. Temple of Shadows, I think, was the second one in that string of albums they did. Good shit. Good, good, yeah, good shit. Worth checking out. Simon. <clears throat> Right, we're gonna see anger. I don't think you can do it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm going to need some kind of alchemy to follow that up. <laughs> oh, hey. hey. See what okay. you see Try what the you veil. Um, Alchemist, Spiritech, another Canberran band. Um, cool, these man. guys, yeah, they're one of the most, one of the most popular and, and diverse extreme bands um, that we spawned. Um, they started as a weird death metal band in 1987, quite quite early on, and just kept getting weirder and adding more avant-garde elements, uh, psychedelic stuff, lyrics about surrealism. Um, then they started adding sort of a native Aboriginal influence into the into the music, um, sort of tribal things. It just kept getting weirder and weirder. Um, then they started banging on about aliens, and I don't know. I, I didn't really pay much attention to that last stuff, but. This one from 19, um, was it 97 or something? I think something like that, 97. Um, Spirit Tech is easily their, their best um, for me. The tracks, uh, Chinese Whispers, um, Road to Uber, Dancing for Life, would get plenty of airplay on Triple J. Um, very deep, organic sounding album. Um, this is the one and only pressing of the thing on local label Thrust again. Um, they did not do an international release of this, so I don't know how easy wow. it is to get Spirit Tech. Really isolated. Yeah, it's very isolated. Um, Relapse picked up a lot of the tracks from this and a bunch of their other stuff and made a compilation called Embryonics, but it does it a bit of a disservice. This album works really well as an album. It flows, so... If you've only known it from the embryonics, yeah, you'll get the hit singles, but um, it really works best as an album, so I'd hunt it down. Um, and being a Canberran band, they picked up that Metal for the Brain um, mantle from Armored Angel and made it even bigger um, in about 97. They turned it into an annual event. It grew to 30-plus bands, multiple stages, had to keep getting bigger and bigger venues. Um, and... That metal for the brain was at just the right time for me in my metal learnings. So from 1998 to 2002, I went down every year. We would find whoever had a car and a license, and we'd jump into the metal mobile, drive four hours down the coast, playing Abagor out the windows, incredibly <laughs> loud volume, um, shitbox metal, metal car, um, check into a cheap youth hostel, see 30 bands, drink too much, get a kebab for breakfast, and then with everybody else, join all the metalheads at the big uh, record shop in Canberra. And no one's had a shower, so the place stunk. <laughs> <laughs> and just buy as many records as you can and then drive home feeling seedy at 9 a.m. Great experience, Metal for the Brain. Great fun. And Alchemist, where, because they put it on, they headlined every year. So I saw them constantly. Um, and after this album, they did an EP called Eve of the War, which is um, a instrumental cover of the uh, War of the Worlds musical song, Eve of the War. When they play that live, that was just just an experience. It was ridiculous. That's when you saw metalheads dancing, and I don't mean moshing. I mean actually dancing. All of them dancing? No, they're sort of <laughs> swaying like it was a goth club or something. It was really weird. <laughs> um, but, yeah, Spirit Tech is an awesome album. Uh, Eve of the War EP after it fantastic as well um so yeah try and get it if you can only get embryonics get that but um spirit tech awesome nice yeah uh, it's, a, it's a cool band i've heard some of their releases not all but they're always uh the things i've heard have always been really cool yeah there's three albums i think after this one um organism was pretty good but then they did one called ostra alien hmm. and it was just too cringy i just couldn't do I it i might have an alchemist stuff. Hmm. Hold on. i need to look yeah, I've got yeah. Or, Organism was the one I came across, and that was one yeah. that was kind of a blind buy. I had heard mm -hmm. the band's name; I knew they were fairly well respected, and it showed yeah. up in the local shop one day. They someone somehow they had gotten a copy of it to distribute. It's like, yep, okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll pick it up and try. And it's yeah, like, yeah, it's really really album, good. Starting with that album, they they seem to get more copies. Yeah, that's Australian. I don't know. It's 
it's all right, I suppose, but it's not Spiritech. Um, the album before this is Lunasphere. That is, that's fairly unhinged, actually. That's a little too crazy. Like, I kind of, I prefer Spiritech. Okay, Alan. All right. Well, if I'm talking um, <clears throat> Dutch heavy metal and I don't mention this one, uh, my buddy Rob over on the West Coast is going to hunt me down and have words with me. So, uh, in the history of metal band names, this is one of the saddest. Uh, Sad Iron. <laughs> Dutch band. This is Isn't their... that the bestial devastation devil? And all your Australian band, Simon, right here is where they trace their imagery and legacy back to. Right here. Be. With Sad Iron. Uh, they did two They did two albums, but here they didn't do two albums. <laughs> Uh, and it's a mascot. We're back on the heavy metal mascot. It's on the other oh album cover that, too. That mascot is a fucking Who the tiger spitting image. <laughs> He's kind oh, of like you know, the like domesticated version of like the creator demon. I think like, this guy's name is like Eugene. You know, he watched <laughs> Night Court. You know, on uh, you know and uh, you know Family Matters on ABC Friday nights. Buy this. I need to buy this right now. It's just, it's just like a nice guy. Um, so, so yeah, the deal with Sad Iron, they made the this album was their first one, uh, from '83. And it's a pretty nondescript Euro metal, it's leaning towards the heavier direction. It's a little more of a you know, meant to be a little thrashier, a little heavier, a little faster than uh, the contemporaries. It's another one, I think, it was on something like Universe Productions. These poor Dutch bands just could not get signed to a label with uh, you know, some clout to it. And that was it. If anyone is wondering, you know, again, weird name, Sad Iron. Uh, <laughs> and yes, there's literally teardrops coming out of the logo. <laughs> yeah, everything about this is just amazing. Uh, the name is apparently an old-fashioned name for an actual iron, the type that you would use to, like, iron a shirt with. That I guess they were called Sad Irons at some point, which I have no idea why they would have called them that, but... Uh, I also don't know why you would name your band after a frickin' iron. It, it's heavy, it, I guess. Anyway, see, they did the album. I, I've heard it. I've never owned it. It's yeah, it's okay. But they did a second album that never got released back in the day. It was, it was recorded in 85, and it's the other one called Antichrist. Uh, it only got an official release finally in... Uh, like 2016 or so. So, you know, uh, one of these retro labels, I forget which one. It may have been, it may have been Cult Metal Classics, but that doesn't quite sound right now that I say it. Anyway, somebody finally put the album out. Uh, and this is something I'd known about for a long time because it's one of those mythical unicorns that's always existed in the tape trading circuit. That Sad Iron did this second album that was, you know, pronouncedly more heavy and faster and a uh, uh, little almost thrashier than the first one. It's a big step up from the original LP. And it's existed in people's collections uh, for years as just, you know, digital files and stuff. Um, and, you know, some people had, you know, made efforts to get it, you know, reissued you know, at different times. But yeah, it, it's finally has seen the light of day, and it's a much heavier affair than the debut. The graphics are just yes, amazing. The band, the logo is amazing. The name is amazing. Uh, but the music is again, it's a very fun listen. Simon really nailed it earlier with that description. This is very much the kind of thing you put on your old battle denim jacket. Uh, you get drunk as all hell, and you throw up the horns, and you just bang like crazy to it. Uh, it's actually it's a very good release. It's it was for a long time. It was one of those classic. Here here's the recording that never saw the light of day type things. And so it's nice that it finally did get you know a legit pressing uh, after so long. So yeah, kudos to Sad Iron, one of the craziest looking things that I'll show tonight. And uh, Rob, there you go. I did not disappoint. I made sure to get Sad Iron in there. Uh, Rob was a huge fan of the Antichrist recordings. Uh, he, he sent them to me years ago, uh, back on the tape trading circuit. I want a t-shirt with that sweet ass tiger on it. <laughs> it doesn't everybody who doesn't want a t-shirt with that tiger on it. Makes tigers of Pantang look like a bunch of posers. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It's not that hard. 
All right. I guess I'm up next. Follow that one, Marty. Oh, I got it. I got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> um, this comes from 1998 and this from the death thrash death metal sphere. This is probably the best album from South America. And this comes from Lima, Peru. This is um, the devil speaks in tongues by mortem. This That's is a awesome. uh, promo copy. I got back in the day from merciless records. Um and it pisses me off that I've never like hunted down an actual copy of this or their other albums because this is basically death metal in the spirit of seven churches possessed. It's a very obvious influence, and the songs are really well done. the The sound, the feel, the execution it sounds like seven churches with maybe a bit more of a modern death metal presentation to it. Um, great dark evil vocals. Absolutely great band. Simon's going to show a little bit more here. Yep. Demon Tales. Demon Tales. That's their debut. Awesome. Yeah, the Merciless. I thought I had that, but I don't know what happened. I must have gave it away or something. I don't know why I would do that, but. Yeah, the first two are amazing. They're great. This this is a, yeah, it's possessed worship straight up. Uh, I wish I could go on and on and on, but Seven Churches, it's uh, the spirit animal of this band for sure. Um, great stuff. Yeah, huge fan of that band. Okay. Well, it's back to me. Back to you. Back to me. All right. Um, another one and done band. Um, another one on Warhead Records. I know um, Ben, I think, quite likes this one. Mr. Brain Smasher. Lord Chaos. Thorns of Impurity. Um, so they did a 1995 demo, uh, Path to My Funeral Light which was basically not distributed. So somehow the, they got an album deal uh, with Warhead and it did uh, Thorns of Impurity. So this is um, band is founded by a guy called Jamie Stinson, who's best known as the name of Astonu. He did this one album and then decided to go to Norway and join Demi Borgir and do Enthroned Darkness Triumphant. But he is the musical creator for Lord Chaos. Um, it's a drum machine because of necessity. They couldn't get a drummer. And that's either good or bad, depending on how you think about it. It's frosty, icy, cold, blistering black metal. Um, the closest band I can think of is is someone like uh, Imperial Crystalline Entombment or Ice, who was a band that was later. Oh, yeah. Um, it's similar stuff to that. It's just bang straight ahead. Um, keyboard layer, but it's fast. It's always fast. Um and the drum machine really gives it that that sound. Um, they're a big deal locally for a while. Everyone was expecting bigger things. There was one more track they did after this that made its way onto a compilation, and then nothing. Then Astonu disappeared, went to Norway, bigger, better things, and uh, never reformed it when he came back to Australia. So it's a shame. Um, that uh, that one extra track they did had a real drummer too. It was showing the sound that they could have had. So yeah, Lord Chaos, Thorns of Impurity um, might be difficult to get. It was only on this Warhead Records. There was rumors of an LP at one point, but not sure what's happening. So yeah, good stuff. If you like blistering fast, icy cold black metal, Lord Chaos. Nice. nice. Yeah, that ice stuff. I I have one of their CDs. It's got them on the cover, and then it's white. It's mostly yeah. white, white and blue, and um, that's the it one. might be a bit of Marduk. Yeah, yeah, a little chaos as well. Um, but they do have that symphonic thing as well, which Astonu carried on to um, that Carpe Tenebrum band that he did, which were pretty bad, but they had that um, that layer of symphonic stuff to it. And obviously in Dimu and Covenant, he went on to do Covenants, Nexus Polaris. So you can hear a lot of that in Lord Chaos. Mm. I I liked the first Covenant. The, that Nexus Polaris was a little too much keyboards for me to take. <laughs> it's it's yeah. it's a bit bit frou frou, um, yeah. but it's so well produced, and um, it came out when I was very early on this journey, and it was just a good time to get that mm -hmm. uh, Nexus Polaris into my bloodstream. So yep. I do like it. Kind of nostalgic. Yep. 
Yeah, I agree, Marty. Though in times before the light is a pretty cool. Oh, it's great. Listen, but yeah, it's and what came after that is just very, very different. Well, the industrial thing after that was oh, not weirder, good. Yeah. It, it, it made, if you take industrial, that was like giving industrial a bad name. It was so bad, <laughs> terrible. Hey, Lord Chaos, good stuff. Other speaking of good stuff, Alan Coulson, there he is. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this this one's not uh, as uh, unintentionally hilarious as uh, my, my previous recommendation. Uh, going to Belgium this time. Uh, another very nondescript band name that's hard to track down. This one's even a little hard to look up on Metal Archives because it's listed kind of funny. But a uh, band called Ritual. So this is not the same Ritual I've talked about before from the Did UK. Did you talk about a Ritual last week? <laughs> I did, yep. Yeah. A Ritual from the UK. That is a that's great a, cover. Gypsy <laughs> Rebets band. Yep, you've got uh, you pulling out all the banger covers tonight. I the, the folks there in the yeah Netherlands and uh, Belgium, their uh, English is not their first language, and <laughs> something gets lost in translation on the way. Uh, did you know Belgium has three official languages: French, Dutch, and something else? Your, your fun yep. geopolitical facts for the night. So, I, whoever's talking to one another, there's some communication problems going on. I'm guessing. Uh, anyway, this uh, this br uh, Belgium version of Ritual made this one EP. It's got four tracks on it. It's a really short listen. It runs about 14 minutes. So uh, I think three of the four songs, if I remember right, are under the three-minute mark. So it goes by really fast. Wow. Uh, yeah, a very short listen. The band didn't really get much put out. This is one that's always been hard to find. The... The lore about the vinyl item was that they printed 500 copies, so small print run to begin with. But one of the members had 300 copies and unexpectedly died, and those 300 copies just sort of got lost slash thrown out slash destroyed when all his you know stuff was you know processed and gotten rid of by his family. So the collecting lore has always said there's only about 200 copies survived and ever made it out into circulation very much. And uh, the metal theologian apparently has one of them. I would not doubt it. Uh, <laughs> I, I am holding up my cell phone because it's a clear indication that I do not have one of them, but it's a cool little EP again, just very, very short in terms of the sound. It owes a nod to the Italian metal scene and just being a little bit weird, a little off center and a little over the top. Um, in terms of other bands, it reminds me again, these bands that have a little bit of an unhinged quality about them that, you know, they're just writing in a very quirky fashion. They're not big name bands, but if folks are familiar with American acts like Max Havoc or, um, uh, sorry, not Max Havoc, Max Planck. Uh, yes, a band named after the physicist. Uh, there's a was a band called Zinner, spelled X-I-N-R, uh, Red Machete. These bands, they have a very quirky kind of delivery to them. <clears throat> the only other thing I can compare it to really is the Italian scene and how some of those bands from the 80s you know, always had this very odd but cool sound to them. Uh, and yeah, that's about really all there is to say about the Belgium version of Ritual, another band that never really got their due. Uh, it's a much beloved little EP when you get into, yeah, you know, you know folks like, you know, Aaron, a lot of, you know, the Corrosium, um, you know, regulars is very much the kind of thing that uh, you know, they're well versed in. And like, you can check it out. There's some of the songs at least are on YouTube, so you can give it a listen. Um, I'm thinking it did get an anthology type reissue release, so you can also track that down. The original one doesn't show up very often, and it's usually a pretty expensive item when it does. But yep, yeah, another one to uh, if you want to really round out that Belgian metal collection, you know, this would be one of the the rarer you know sort of centerpieces uh, from that particular country. Awesome. That means I'm up. Um. I just recently got these. Not recently, I guess. Uh, Brain Smasher, who we've discussed, was in the chat for a while. He gave these to me some time ago as a VCLT package. Um, this is um, Columbia's Witch Trap. This is Witching Metal and No Anesthesia. They're so fun. 
really yeah. uh, basically venom mixed with slayer mixed with uh sweden's niflheim yep yep i mean yep. that it, it's pretty much it's it's thrashy fun black death i don't know how you want to classify it but it's thrashy and it's fun it's sloppy it's campy it's good it's fun it's fun stuff um yeah this uh what do we got here i've got one called sorceress bitch it's that is movie. their debut full length that came out in 2012 this uh yeah. witching metal is a their first ep it came out in 2000 and no anesthesia is their second day de- uh second full length in 2006 Yep. So, I mean, there isn't, like I said, Niflheim mixed with Venom mixed with Slayer. You know, maybe a little R Noir in there. I think yep, R Noir yep, is yep. a little more uh, unique and creative in the sound, but definitely Niflheim is in this. Or also, what's the other uh, other band? Uh, Death Hammer from. Uh, oh, Roman. yeah, yeah. Totally Death Hammer. There's yeah, a yeah. lot of Death Hammer in this, too. So, I mean, there's obviously a whole movement of. Uh, fucking bug. Whole movement of. Um, thrash black and thrash that sounds like this and these guys are riding that wave but it's good it's fun stuff for sure it's so loose yeah absolutely it's loose it's one of those things you put on you don't really have to think about and it's just fun to listen to yeah, it's beer metal it's great yep um speaking of great we got simon <laughs> from down in australia <laughs> Joined us he might they might shrimp on, on the bobby, bobby might <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, had to do it. I, had to, I couldn't get through this without saying that shit. Yeah, I, I am amazed we made it this long before uh, it happened. <laughs> I got, I got nothing. I got nothing. Um, but no, what I do have is the debut from Golgoth and Remains, Perverse Offerings to the Void, modern band, um, Sydney band formed in 2016. Um, this is from 2018, their first album. They did a very low run demo tape in this album there's a new album they've just announced coming out it's got some pretty cool cover art so good to see they're still going australia's emulation it's as simple as that that's what these guys are it's dark death metal it's got a lot of dissonance in it um grave miasma vibes heaps of that um lucifer but not as blackened i think you're getting the picture that's sort of what these guys play um being a sydney band i've seen them live six times now they always get better each time. They're just refining themselves, getting better and better, tighter. The guitarist, Matt, he even plays like um, Robert Vigner from Immolation, like that same, you know, if you've seen Immolation, the way that he attacks the guitar when he's playing live, it's exactly the same. He does exactly the same thing. They are a fantastic band. Um, this, I think the CD was self-released. Um, yeah, the CD was, but the, the LPs on... Uh, could be wrong like profound law or a label like that they got a fairly big label to do the lp um might be right on that i'm not entirely sure but um great band um definitely getting picked up by um uh, international fans and um yeah hopefully more to come really soon definitely check them out great stuff awesome alan all right, coming back around here. Uh, Aaron asked about this one in the chat just a couple of minutes ago, and I'm happy to oblige. So, Belgium this time uh, for a band called White Knight, uh, not spelled with a K. Uh, yeah, decent enough little black and white cover there. This is a three track EP from 85. Let me double check that. 85 sounds right. Uh, yeah, 85, called Death Rendezvous. A uh, couple of things that are funny about this one. One is that the, the three-song title, you know, the cover definitely looks like, okay, yeah, that's that's got some cult potential to it. You would pick that up based on the cover art. Someone's sister drew that cover, and they're pretty proud of it. I, you know, <laughs> This is the danger of letting, you know, the band members' girlfriends do artwork. Um, it, it happens sometimes. If you flip it over and look at the song titles, though, you sort of start to have some second thoughts because the song titles almost sound like, you know, rejects from a Guns N' Roses EP or something. You you have Wild Night, Hollywood, and Heavy Metal Angel. Oh, God. So, yeah, the the song titles give you a pause. Uh, 
Musically, it's not bad, though. It's, again, it's a standard-sounding Euro metal EP. The thing that sets this one off from uh, some of the others I've talked about tonight, the vocals have this kind of weird, lower, gravelly sound to them. It, it sounds a little bit like he's trying to imitate maybe a you know, gravedigger, but you know, keeping it you know from being quite so over the top, but not by much. So, yeah, if you want some strange song titles, uh, put on to some you know, very straightforward, you know, traditional European heavy metal, and you want the vocal, you know, make it sound like, you know, Gravedigger made a quick run across the, uh, the border to do some guest vocals, then White Knight is the one you're looking for. It's the only thing the band did, to my knowledge. Another small label release. It's one you don't see very often. This one's always been a little pricey, which is one reason I never tracked it down yeah it's a decent enough release but it's not one i want to pay the going rate for my my heavy metal collecting cred is just not that cool and my wallet is not quite that big so never picked it up it's part of my digital collection i'm you know quite happy to dust it off and play the tracks every now and then so another very cool but obscure one if you're trying to round out uh that collection from the benelux countries in belgium all right, okay. Marie, what you got? Well, I am done with the the uh, South America stuff, but I've cheated a little bit, and I'm going to gravitate north to Mexico. This is not South America; they're neighbors. Um, but there's three things that I grabbed out of here that I'm just going to show off as it comes around to me because I I figured Simon and Alan would have more than I did. But um, this is a, an album I picked up in a bargain bin in a cutout bin. At Camelot Records back in the day for a buck. And um, it, it amazes me that this this album has like been reissued recently. People are talking about this band again. I remember getting this and thinking it was okay. But listening to it again, it's a lot better than I remember it. And that is Mortuary's Blackened Images. Hmm. As you can see, it's a JL America Turbo USA with a... The drill, like Camelot would have a one dollar cutout bins, and man, I, that I, original's I, worth quite a bit. Yeah, and it, I I miss Camelot music, man. That place was so fucking awesome. But yeah, this is an original pressing from back in the day, 91, 90, 1990. Hmm. It's great. Absolutely great Mexican death. A little bit of thrash mixed in. Really good hammering. Well produced. I mean, it's great. And I don't know why this band never had a bigger following back then other than the fact that it was on Jail America. The only band mm. that really did anything on that label is Beharit, which is kind of mm. funny because, uh, you know, Oath of Black Blood is sounds like dog shit. And the people that say they love that stuff, man, I don't know. How can you love that? It's interesting. And for the time it came out, it's kind of cool, but this is way more composed, way better. <laughs> <laughs> by i mean granted the beharit was just demos but um good shit mexican love i mean neighbors to the north of south america for sure neighbors to our south hail the mexican hordes man this shit's great and i've got a couple more things from mexico i'm going to show on my cool. next couple turns around here and it is simon sorry all right i chose not to show disembowelment because i think everybody knows disembowelment and they're great they great they're so i will great. show Inverloch, which is the spiritual successor yep to disembowelment. Much, but not as good uh, is oh i don't know it's 50 percent of the band um when they first started with the ep um i believe they would because there's only an ep it's three tracks i think they chucked in a disembowelment song or two when they played live um but that was only down in victoria then i did the album which is um distance collapsed and that's just more of the same. I have not I heard know. the album. It's more of the same with the EP. It's it's really good. I I don't want to say I rate it more than Disembowelment, but I gravitate towards listening to this more than Disembowelment. It's just fresh. Uh, maybe I've just played Disembowelment too much. Um, it's heavy as a bunch of elephants. It's, oh, my God. Uh, crushing, absolutely crushing. Um, when they I saw them play live, the sound just filled the entire room. It's just devastatingly heavy stuff. Um, That's the benefit of playing slower. 
I yep. think I think you know yep. a lot of uh, sound guys can figure that out pretty quick, and your uh, your sound is going to benefit in the live uh, environment a lot better. Slow yep. and heavy, you know. That's exactly what it is. It's just slow and heavy. Both on relapse, they got you know signed very early, which is you know obviously based on the heritage. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully we get more from them. Um, they, they're one of those bands that don't do a great deal. The EP was 2012. The album was 2016. They played, I saw them in 2018 or 2019, um, supporting Incantation. I think it was that gig. It was just a heavy as. Um, and play just like Disembowelment. So it was mainly Death Doom, then a bit of Funeral Doom, and then just random blasts for the hell of it. So yeah, yeah, good band. In the lock, I think. In the lock's actually a town in Victoria. That's oh, really? They, yeah. The town one thing the... I've heard, it, it didn't have one thing I really liked about disembowelment was the the atmospherics of it. It was very yeah. unique and strange. And Inverlock, like you said, the spiritual successor, and and it does mm-hmm. sound like disembowelment in a lot of ways. But it just it was missing something. I don't know if it was just the the member that wasn't in the band that brought the weird shit. I don't know. But try the album if you've only heard the EP. Try the I've album. I've only heard the EP. Yeah, yeah. It's mm. good. Hey, Mr. Allen. Okay. Well, stop me if you've heard this one before. I, a band out of the Netherlands in the early and mid 80s that got one vinyl product out and some demos and uh, nothing else. Uh, this one is a single by a band named Sword. <laughs> These, these bands really went with the simple band name. <laughs> and the really simple covers. And, and yeah, you know, obviously, you know, kind of, you know, small, you know, low budget affair here. Uh, this single was a pain in the ass to track down. It's one that for a while you could find it. And then overnight copies just seemed to dry up. Um, so, yeah, an, an old collecting buddy over in Switzerland helped me finally track down a copy of this because it sat on my want list for way, way, way too long. But um, it pairs up uh, two tracks. The main track, Excalibur, is speed metal. They're playing very fast. and It's not bad. It's a little loose sounding. You can tell the band's still kind of working out the kinks, but it's a good enough track. Uh, the flip side is different. It's called I've Been Trying. It's uh, a more mid-paced number. Uh, it's much catchier. It's got a really good chorus hook to it. So the songs are kind of a little different in style, but I like both the songs on it, which is you know why I spent a long time trying to go ahead and track it down. Same old story, though. They aren't doing anything new. They're not reinventing the wheel here. They demoed some material for a couple years afterwards, but couldn't ever get any exposure and that was kind of the end of the line for sword uh, there are other bands of course that have had this name it's a generic name if you type it into discogs hey, let me help you dig through all the different you know swords you'll look at 56 of them before you'll find the right one <laughs> but yeah it's just another cool little single that's been buried in time and dust from that little you know portion of central europe i love that sword is Alan making these bands up? <laughs> I it's it's kind of interesting. I hadn't you know, until we you know picked the topic, and I was thinking like, yeah, I'll do some of those Central European countries. Yeah, it really hadn't occurred to me that you know how much of a pattern there was to this. That you know when I pulled up all the you know bands from these things in my digital collection, it's like <laughs> there really is just a set pattern over and over again. That's solid music. But, you know, shitty little labels, no exposure. You got the one vinyl product out and disappeared. And, you know, kind of a shame. But uh, su- such is the heavy metal history of Benelux. Is there a heavy metal band called Heavy Metal? I'm willing to bet there is. Oh, that that sounds just cheesy enough that someone probably has done it. Gotta I'll be. find out while we move over to Marty. <laughs> Well, I'm still in Mexico. I'm only doing a couple more of these, and both of these bands are very closely related. This is uh, Cenotaph, the gloomy reflections of our hidden sorrows. Ah, uh, yep, yep. This is an Oz production or Oz. Great album. Records. Um, most people are used to. For some reason, the the J card, the booklet has got the actual cover. There's like mm. a an additional cover with it. Uh, so I don't know. Most people are used to this too. one. Yeah. But uh, this band features Daniel Corchado from the band The Chasm. 
which I might as well just show that now since we're talking. This is the debut Chasm album. Oh, please, um, please give me that. Is that an original, Marty? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, it is. Nice. Procreations of the Inner Temple. Goodbye, Absolutely Hal. killer band. At this band, I've seen this band probably five times over the years. Um, they're amazing. They're so good live. They are the, the true essence of heavy metal. And they're so good. The best, one of the best live bands I've ever seen. I've hung out with Daniel. I've talked to Daniel, interviewed him over the years. He's a great dude. Um, he's got a new band. I can't remember the name of it. It starts with an A, S, or Atus or something. But Cenotaph is pretty much, this came out in 92. This is straight up uh, brutal death metal emulation, but not like slam New York style. Just like dark, murky, brutal death metal uh, with a little bit of a me Mexican flair to it. Anything Daniel's in is great. Um, he sang on the um, the Incantation album, which I'm suddenly I'm drunk enough that I've forgotten the name of it. It's my favorite Incantation album. Monuments to Golgotha? No, no, it's the other one. I'm drawing a blank. Too. <laughs> the other one. They got 25 <laughs> albums. But we know it's, which one, one. It's, it's after Procession. Diabolical Conquest. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's my favorite Incantation. I love all the Incantation stuff, but. Daniel just really goes for it on that album and crushes, but check out the chasm, check out Cenotaph. Absolutely great Mexican yeah. death metal. I know my, my topic is South America, but we're gonna we're okay. gonna give these guys a pass because I want to talk about it. So yeah. I've never seen an original copy of that first chasm album before, Marty. That's really cool. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little bit jealous over here. I've, I've got originals of the second one, the third one, but I do not have yep. an original of the first Same. one. Yep. I'm all sorted on everything else. But not as far as I know, it's original. I don't know. Yeah, you, you, you would know. Yep. I mean, it's only been repressed once or twice, and they're pretty obvious. There's like a Digipack repressing of it. Yeah, this is not from that. From 10 um, years ago. That's what I've got. Even that's kind of a pain to find, I think. Yeah, it is. Know. Merciless Germany, Morbid Germany, Reborn, Mexico, Witch Hunt. <laughs> Holy Relapse USA. I don't know. Maybe this is a reissue. I don't know for sure. People in the chat are just going to have to let me know. But It looks it looks original. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> anyway, Simon. Cool. That's not Simon. Nope. That That's me. Um, this one I can do quick, and I would feel bad if I didn't do this one. Not so. too quick, because I got to pee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Simon. Quick as you can. All right. <laughs> and with them back to Marty. No, um, Hobbs mm. have to have Hobbs, uh, Hobbs Angel of Death. It felt wrong to not include Australia's answer to Slayer, uh, in this. Uh, that's exactly what it is. I mean, look at him, it's it, it's exactly what it says on the cover. That's what you get. It's even got the band in little Australia on the back there. Nice, <laughs> so good. Um, <laughs> and and a whole bunch of uh, Infernal Majesty as well. I mean, Slayer, Infernal Majesty equals Hobbs, Angel of Death. That's what you're getting. Um, 1988 self-titled debut. Um, that's actually on Steam Hammer, SPV. So you got proper release. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Hobbs is yeah, Peter Hobbs. There he is down there. Um, unfortunately, passed away in uh, 2019, I think. And oh. Didn't know that. Which is really, yeah, he was um, nearly 60 or so, I think. And they were about to do a show in Sydney um, with a bunch of other metal bands. They were going to do a, a headlining show, and um, he was too sick, so they cancelled the show. And then a couple of months later, he passed away. Hmm. Um, he, yeah, Hobbs lived and breathed metal. He was all bullet belts and studded arm bands. Hmm. It was just, he was, he was Mr. Metal. Everybody likes this album. Um, everybody, you know, reveres Hobbs. He was just one of those Australian. You know, he, he was he was the, the one of the godfathers of Australian thrash. Classic, yeah. yeah. So yeah, fantastic. Hobbs, Angel of Death. A lot everybody of Destroyer six 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 influence in that shit too. Uh, the drummer on this is the drummer for the principal of uh, the first principal um, EP. Yeah. From Destroyer. They share. I think it's I think that's how it works. Violence is the Prince of This World. That's the one. Violence is the Prince of This World. Yeah. yeah I'm pretty sure it's the same drummer as, as this one. So awesome. He's done a few other albums, but um I always just listen to that one. Awesome. Alan. 
All right, since we're sort of starting to wrap things up, uh, similar to Simon, this is one I can do kind of fast, but uh, definitely wanted to mention it. This is a band that never made an album, and it's kind of a shame. They made a demo, and it's a really damn good one. It is... Uh, making sure I'm not getting my countries mixed up, because it's getting late. Yeah, they were a Dutch band uh, called Valkyrie. They did one demo in 86 called Deeds of Prowess. And if that title doesn't give it away, these guys were very much doing the epic heavy metal take on early Man of War. Uh, they were really going for the like end of glory riot vibe. And if you don't believe me, uh, let's check out the picture over on the mothership. Uh, blam. <laughs> You tell me these guys didn't listen to End of Glory Ride. Damn. Oh, my God. Those shields. They don't even have bodies worth oiling up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th these are like, you know, the, the, the scab wrestlers you know, that are you know, brought in for, like, you know, WCW and, you know, Turner in 1982 just to get Hurry squashed by the, the nation boy. But, you know, he's, this guy right here, he's trying. He's trying. Oh, he's, he's got the pose. He's got the, the little key man, you know, cross leather strap thing he needs to spend a little more time doing some reps I, uh, you know <laughs> hey they're they're still at the demo phase they got time to beef up a little bit before they have to you know go out and totally hail and kill um yeah that aside they do a damn good job nailing the early man of war vibe they really do if you I'm like the boy ride hail I'm to listening. england this this demo is worth checking out i don't know if it's ever gotten a proper reissue anyway. For me, it's one that uh, this is a case where I had the demo uh, unlabeled for years. I got it with a bunch of Witchcross demos, and it very clearly wasn't Witchcross. I'm like, that doesn't sound like any of this other stuff, but I had no idea who it was. Somebody had just tacked it onto the end as extra tracks, but forgotten to include who it, the heck it was. And I couldn't get in touch with the person to find out what they had recorded on it. And this is one that um, folks over at the Corrosium website helped me eventually sleuth out. You know, I finally just, they had, I think, a thread going for like, you know, uh, unknown, you know, bands or unknown, you know, songs in your collection that you need labeled. You know, and I described what it was, you know, and I listed the song titles and, uh, yeah, a fellow with the screen name of Black Axe, you know, immediately pinned it. He's just like, oh, I know exactly. Ep epic heavy metal with those song titles, that's the Valkyrie demo. And I looked it up, and damn if he wasn't right. So, uh, yes, Black Axe, I have not forgotten that you figured that one out for me. If you are Shout out there, out I Black still... Black Axe, if you're watching. I, I still owe you a beer for uh, helping me figure out what that demo was, because it's a fantastic demo, a really strong sound in that style. And I would never, I'd still be trying to figure that damn thing out if it wasn't uh, wasn't for his help. Uh, for, for, forget, yeah, like early Man of War, you, you look past the cheese and, and you get some really exceptional heavy metal off that demo. A real shame they didn't get to record other stuff. It's really too bad a lot of people can't look past the cheese of Man of War because it's so good. I mean, there's some there's some great shit in those early albums. So good. Yeah, yeah. With the earlier stuff, it, it's very strong. Oh, and just as a nod here too, Valkyrie did feature a member of Future Tense, who I uh, mentioned earlier as one of the better releases from that country. Also, right all right, Marty. What? Anything else you got to? I have, uh, I have shot my wide. I'm going back to Simon here. All right, Simon. Any that you wanted to wrap up with? Yeah, I've got two more. Okay. Um, all right. So the next one. Um, this is a Queensland death metal band. Uh, if Melanie is still watching, I think you would dig this one. This is a band called Crypt. And yes, that has been scribbled by the band members uh, all over the front. I have yet to find a copy of this that they have not scribbled on. I think they must <laughs> find everything. I really hate autographs, man. I don't want my shit wrote on. I just don't. Yeah, I want to see the volcano. I can't because it's got scribbles coming out of it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, the album's called El Nino. Um this came out in 98. It's the only full-length album. Uh, they did um, an EP and a demo in uh, 94 and 96, something along those lines. Um, super groovy death metal, um, go gory, zombie-filled lyrics. They went from a five-piece down to a four-piece on this album, so down to one guitar, and that made them way more uh, tight. 
uh, particularly live. They were really quite a force to watch live. Um, unique vocals, a bit like a Bremelin that kind of predated that Brie Brie nonsense. Um, <laughs> it's, it still has the enunciation, so you know what's going on, but he just lets a lot of things just tail out with Brie on the end of it. Um, but this is this is what I would say is, is head bang, head banging circle pit death metal. That's what this is. Um, very good fun. They they used to come down to Sydney and play quite a bit. Um, the this album is challenging to find, but um, recently the band just sort of put everything they ever did into this little box, which they called disgusting zombie metal. <laughs> And this is heaps easier to find. I didn't need this because I've got all the originals, but I thought, why not? It was literally $8 on Amazon. Wow. Um, so you get, you know, there's a booklet. It's got a giant patch. Um, and the CD is a little slimline thing. So you get the, the uh. demo, which is brilliantly <laughs> hilarious. Um, you get the EP, which is really good. Um, and then there's the album without signatures on it. So you get all of that. And it was like $8. I imagine wow. you just get it very cheap. Um, so, yeah, anybody that just likes their death metal a bit groovy and fun and moshy. A little bit of brie, brie, brie. Uh, a, a little bit, but not enough that I say it's it's some kind of, like, devourment clone or whatever. It's it's just, yeah, they're crypt. Really good. Um, they sort of exist. They, they did 7-inch with one new track a couple of years ago, and then they did some touring. So, I don't know, maybe we'll get more. But, yeah, crypt. Um. Alan, do you have another one? I've got uh, two more, yeah, so we can go back and forth one more round. Uh, let's see. Uh, another one from the Netherlands that... Uh, 17th verse, same as the first. Uh, band called Hammerhead. They made this uh, one EP. It's called uh, Heart Made of Steel. Uh, another winner of the local 8th <laughs> grade art contest. <laughs> But um, what you get, and this is not the uh, British hammerhead. My 13 year old brother's an artist, guys. Oh, cool. I, uh, it looks hey, like hey, a, you know, when that one record, you know, company, uh, you know, uh, in town offers you know, to print up 35 copies of your thing for, you know, $32, you don't argue too much. You don't have a whole lot of room to negotiate with what they put on the cover, I guess. But. The music on here, this one has a more polished sound than most of what I've shown tonight. Most of what I've shown tonight has been you know, very straightforward denim and leather mid-80s Euro metal. This one is definitely got a more polished... Uh, it's not party metal. It, it's not you know, hair metal. But it definitely has a more you know commercial lean to it. Th this is something that could have probably been played on a, ra a rock radio station and people wouldn't have you know, thought too weird of it. Really good vocalist, strong songwriting. And again, a very nice production job. Even though these, you know, I've joked about these being you know, very small time labels, whoever was turning the knobs and, you know, and producing these things knew what they were doing. They uh, spent a lot more time you know, in the uh, production room than they did the art class. Uh, so yeah, it sounds good. The songs are very catchy, very slick sounding. Um, it owes uh, a lot to some of those more commercial-leaning new wave of British heavy metal bands. Um, the ones that aren't held in quite as high a regard today because it feels like, yeah, they were just a little more accessible and mainstream than a lot of folks want when they get into that obscure heavy metal. But among that style of band, this is one of the better ones. Um, it's one I had no idea what to expect when I first heard it and was really pleasantly surprised. I'm like, for that style, if you're in that mood... That is a very well put together set of songs. Uh, it's one I don't know what it's going for today. There's no excuse. I should own it. I've seen it for like twelve bucks many a time back in the day, and just it was always the one thing that got left out. You know, when I would you know finally check out, it, it just never quite made the final cut when I was having to count down to the last few quarters I had. But uh, it's a cool little album. But yeah, you, you're not getting denim and leather here. You're getting more like you know the. You know, the smart blazer look was probably what these guys were going for from the mid '80s. The, but Han, the, Solo, the Han Solo look with the white shirt and the black vest. Daddy there you go. go. That's that's what we're talking. I, I I don't have a picture of the back cover, but if one of those guys is not wearing a vest and has a perm, I, I, I'll eat my uh, non-existent Hammerhead album cover. <laughs> All right. 
All right, Simon, you said you had one more? Yep. Um, I'll give some honorable mentions before my sure. last one. Because uh, this one came up in the chat and I did forget about it, which is Cruciform. Um, they're a Melbourne death doom band. They did this one album um, and one EP. They're, they're absolutely crushing stuff. Not the disembowelment, sort of really slow, chuggy stuff. This is a bit more... Um, a bit more atmospheric death doom i guess and what's really interesting is the vocalist is a drummer um so when you watch them live he's snarling away and pounding the skins it's really cool um they still play live i don't know if there's new material coming or not but very um well recognized well respected victorian band uh it's cruciform other um modern bands i think there's three that come to men uh, come to mind that um Due to the you know the internet age now and Bandcamp bands, they've already got international um, acclaim. That's uh, Gutless, there's Melbourne. Um, these are all Victorian bands. Gutless, who are at demo stage, have done a, a split with um, uh, Mortal Wound as well, so they're um, getting well known. Vile Apparition, who have uh, done an album and EP, have another album coming. Another good death metal band. The biggest one is Faceless Burial. Um, they had an album on MSUO and they're doing really well. Their drummer is a maniac. I've seen them live. He is crazy. He's got some jazz skills for sure. So they're three uh, watch this space bands because I think they're all going to blow up, particularly Faceless Burial. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about, this is Temple Nightside, uh, Condemnation, their first album. This is uh, it's on 2013. It's on Dark Descent. It's actually a fairly early Dark Descent Records release. Um, it sounds like it was recorded in a damp cave and it was mic'd up a kilometre away from the cave's entrance. It's um, <laughs> not for everybody, but it's for fans of uh, Portal, Vassifor, Grave Upheaval, Impetuous Ritual, uh, sludgy, churning, gross, blackened, death, doomy, just it's it's one that you chuck on and you can kind of just sail away with it you can't go hunting for the cool riff in it or the fun solo it's not one of those ones um some people call this kind of stuff riffless death metal as in it doesn't have any riffs i don't think that's a very nice thing to say <laughs> i don't agree with that it's um very fast trem riffs is what you get on this one but the overall overall presentation is quite slow and just black heaving mass yep the hecatomb's the one after this one um but i really gravitate towards this first one on dark descent uh, condemnation they re-recorded it and called it re-condemnation um last year or something i'm not sure why i still prefer this original um it started as a two-piece it's not much to show it's all very dark with a guy called mitch keepen um lives down south coast somewhere and drummer called Jon McLaughlin, who's one of those guys, just like I mentioned, that plays in 20 other bands. Um, that can't be a real name. Jon <laughs> McLaughlin. Sounds fake. Sounds like Sarah's brother. <laughs> Sarah McLaughlin. Oh, Christ, there's actually possibility. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was... something became too real. Oh, Do they play with, away. like, some sad dogs that have been abused in the background? <laughs> Back to the band. Yeah. <laughs> way, way to bring us down there, Marty. <laughs> yeah, totally. He's killing me. Absolutely killing me. It was um, all fun and games until the puppy got kicked. Yeah, the puppy got like not fed for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So the skinny puppy? Um, <laughs> if you've heard of the... There's a depressive black metal band called Oster. Uh, Oster. I'm not sure how you say it. I think they got a bit of um, a bit of promotion a few years ago. That's, uh, that's the same guy. This is the the black and death doom cousin to austere um so anyway yeah they got temple nightside um they're on i think nuclear wall now if not they sound like one of those bands so there you go good stuff um that's really it for me so uh here we go here's you. a question to for the ages is this stream in celebration of the black album turning 30 today it is not oh, exactly I, I i already replied to that no no, very much not. Uh, I would rather Sand listen to true. someone fart into a fan for 40 minutes than uh, listen to Enter Sandman ever, ever, ever again. Yeah, ever. It's not even the worst song on the album. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. No. 
<laughs> but you know what? Nothing else matters but what Alan's going to talk about. <laughs> you got one, Alan? Oh, for, for that one, Simon, you are unforgiven. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tread on me, man. <laughs> uh, I, I will tell my, my, my one Metallica Black Album story real quick. That came out like uh, my senior year of high school, so everybody was super hyped for it. Oh. Uh, Every, just chomping at the bit for weeks and weeks waiting for that album to hit the shelf. The weekend it came out, you know, managed to get, you know, to the big city, to a record store that had it, bought the cassette, you're literally just shaking with excitement. Get it home, pop it in the Walkman, you know, get out, you know, the J card, you know, get comfy on the bed with the headphones, you know, to check it out and absorb every lyric. I fell asleep before I got through side A of that tape. I woke up the next morning you literally sitting there, just headphones still on, J card laying there on the bed, and just like, the hell happened? <laughs> and like looking at the tape, you know, it got to the end of side A, and just like, I didn't hear those last two songs. <laughs> oh, that's not a good sign. <laughs> I've never liked that out. Al that album just nah did nothing for me. Anyway, let's get back to uh, some other things. Uh oh, Rick's up to something <laughs> here. That's very true. <laughs> yes, they remember to actually mic up Jason. Yeah, for that oh, one. Yeah. Yep. yeah. There, there was a funny interview clip with Lars uh, or the producer from uh, And Justice a few years ago that, you know, he That's swears crazy. up and down that, you know, in the studio, Lars kept telling him over and over, just like, Keep, turn the bass down more, turn the bass down more, turn the bass down more. And here, like, you know, within the past five years or so ago, when they did some kind of, it was probably the 33rd anniversary of, you know, And Justice's release. Lars was talking to the guys. He's like, by the way, what was wrong with the bass sound? Why'd you mess that up so bad in the production? He's just like, I wanted to strangle that little fucker so bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's wrap this up with a couple more slabs of uh, fun but unknown uh, Dutch metal. Couldn't talk about Dutch metal without talking about a band called Angus. Um, they made two albums, one in 86, one in 87. Uh, they got the reissue treatment relatively early on. Sentinel Steel Records did a two CD set, uh, you know, so they put both of them out together as a nice little package. Back, they probably did that one in the very late '90s or the early early 2000s. I'm not sure. Uh, both albums are pretty decent. The one I'll mention here is called Track of Doom, not Tracks of Doom. It's singular because I guess maybe they felt they only had one good song on the album or something. Uh, we are dealing with. Uh, battling Centaur Heavy Metal. Oh, I remember that album. I've yep. seen it in stores. Yep. Yeah. Th nah. This one, this one, you know, got a little more circulation than some Fucking of the other bands. Off some centaurs, of man. Country. That shit's ripped. Y y it's yeah. Awesome. The guys in Valkyrie should have, you know, been doing, you know, taking a, having these guys spot them or something. <laughs> Spotters. Yeah. You've got to, you, know, you got two uh, burly centaurs duking it out in the middle of a thunderstorm there. That's pretty fucking metal. Yeah. yeah. And the album's pretty fucking metal, too. Again, there is nothing groundbreaking about this. No one's ever going to point at Angus as being innovative. But you can definitely listen to it and be fun. They were very much kind of straddling the line on wanting to incorporate some of that sort of epic fantasy you know, man of war -isms. And you could tell they were trying to rein it in just a little bit. That, you know, they wanted it to be like, you know, 10% less cheesy than Into Glory Ride. Um... I'm not sure if they succeeded or not, but but they were making a decent effort at it. And once again, their albums had pretty good production. Uh, the sound quality is there. You know, the songs are fun and such. But um, yeah, they, they cranked out the two albums and then sort of disappeared off into the mists. So that's Angus. And mm. um, I would wrap up with that one, but since folks have had so much fun with uh, some of the album covers tonight, and, and we've had some doozies, we're going to fade out with uh, this one, another band uh, that was Dutch. This one was another early one on Mausoleum, uh, a band called Dark Wizard. Their first thing was an EP called Devil's Victim. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I just ain't going to mess with that. That's a Dark oh. Wizard. If I ever, if, if in my that's mind... A, Dark it, wizard I'm not sure exactly if that's the Dark like. Wizard or if that's the Devil's Victim or if the Dark Wizard is the Devil's Victim, but uh, wow. that dude's blue. I need that right now. That, that dude is very blue. No fucking logo. I mean, come on. Any seventh grader could have come up with a better logo for a Dark Wizard band than that. And that dude's blue. 
I'm not sure if he's a fish person. I mean, there's something's not right there. He's not a skeleton, but he's not. Looks more like a slipknot mask or something. I, he, yeah, he's, he's a sleeve What's the name of the, the movie that uh, Cameron shot with uh, the, all the blue people? Avatar? Yeah, that's no, no. Avatar <laughs> Wizard. I, I don't know. I'm... I, I'm getting some kind of like you know mayor man vibe going here. I, I I don't I don't know what to make of that, but uh, bands, you know, when someone's doing your cover artwork for you, check to make sure they're not colorblind no, before the, you let them finish. The 80s up. were such a great time for shitty covers, man. I you know that 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 right there, that's some that's that's a color scheme that was mm. not meant to grace the cover of something called a Devil's Victim. So why am I looking for it on Discogs? Ah, that is why we brought you on because we knew you would. But Come on, yeah, guys! That's the damn dark wizard. Musically, it's as straightforward as you can get uh, for eighties, you know, uh, Euro metal. Uh, not not a bad listen, but yeah, you, you, you'll want to burn your eyes out if you stare at that cover for too long. I'm looking at the digital version on my own screen. It's got little bats in the background. It's great. Mm -hmm. He's got a stitch on his head, too. <laughs> Simon's going down the rabbit hole. We've got to pull the plug. Oh, yeah. Add to cut. Add to cut. <laughs> got to cut him off. <laughs> All right. I think I think we're good. I think uh, we've made cool. it. And I got to say, I've Three seen hours, a, lot of, a lot of new names in the chat tonight. Thank you so much, folks, for checking mm -hmm. out the show. And you got, you got a mission. You got to subscribe to Explosive Action. You got to subscribe to Let's Talk Metal. Yes, subscribe to this channel, Marty Worm, so then you know when new shows are coming up. Um, we've really had a great time tonight, Simon. Thank you so much for hanging with us. Well, thanks for having me. Been very fun. All kinds of cool stuff that you've shown off. Absolutely great. Absolutely fun. Um, you did fuck up a little bit, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> let it go, Marty. Let it go. No, We're trying to make misery no only happen, tricks. Marty. It's oh. not happening, Marty. No. Yeah. <laughs> Misery Omen is not fetch, Marty. <laughs> He's still trying to make it happen. That's right. <laughs> but um, we appreciate all you folks for watching us. And I do have to say, along with uh, subscribing to our channels, tomorrow night, I I, I was um, negligent last week. I was supposed to announce, we were on Saturday last week. I was supposed to announce that the Satterslay um, crew, the, the streaming crew on Saturday nights were coming up. And we were so busy with shit I forgot. But Definitely check out the Satter Slay crew, whether you go through um, um, Dreadful Minutes with Rick or um, Brian Arkham's channel or Jeff Metal Madness 66. They have a great little stream thing going on as well. Um, definitely check them out. And we appreciate everybody. We have no idea who's coming next week, but we'll get it figured out. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me tonight. Always fun, Marty. Absolutely. Always fun, yep. Thanks for having me again. You All bet, right. man. Anytime. We hope you come back again sometime. I have to go through my uh, my collection, find some even more obscure Australian bands. Right on, right on. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Y'all have a good night. Anybody else think everybody have anything else to add before we jump? Everybody have a good weekend. Yep, I'm going to have some lunch. Right on. See you I'm going to look at that Dark Wizard album cover some more. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've already bought it. It's on its way. <laughs> yeah, he's playing it in my car. That's been sitting in some bin in Australia for fucking 20 fucking years. You never know. I might get lucky. I might get lucky. <laughs> See you later. Y'all have a good night. Guys. Take care. I'll take care. <laughs>